Well, good morning and welcome to City Hall. We're going to get started with the invocation. Dr. Owen Neese is the pastor at Emmaus Baptist Church. He's going to lead us in the invocation. Afterwards, I'll ask Councilman Stone if he'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. But would everyone please stand? Father, thank you for your love and kindness in our lives. God, we know the more that you work in our lives, the more that we're able to show that love and kindness to those around us. God, set us free from the pressure of trying to be someone on the outside that we're not on the inside. God, we, we know we don't have anything to prove, no one to impress. God, we just want to serve you by serving others. Father, we bring a lot of anxiety and a lot of baggage with us each day, but God, we believe that you can bring peace and order. God, I pray for the business that is done today, that you would provide wisdom and courage. Father, thank you for our city. God, we believe the best is yet to come. Uh, let us live with hope and joy. Let us encourage and build up one another so we grow stronger together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Right, we're going to start by uh, talking about one of our favorite events uh, in Oklahoma City, and that is Open Streets. So I'll ask the members of the Oklahoma City County Health Commission, the board, what's the right term to use for this group? Department. Of course, I would try to make it fancier than it needed to be. Open Streets is an opportunity for people to get outside and enjoy Oklahoma and private sector vendors come in and, and open it up, but literally it is just people taking the streets, getting outside, being active, um, and enjoying different neighborhoods in Oklahoma City. I'm gonna hand the microphone to Carrie and let her explain it more eloquently. Thank you. Um, how many of you have been to Open Streets? Oh, a lot of you. Um, so we will be on Northwest 23rd Street on Sunday, April 8th. We will close down one mile of 23rd Street, and then we'll also close down a little bit of Walker up into the Paseo Arts District. So we will have over 70 different activities for kids and families to come participate in. It's free, um, and there's going to be 30 food trucks, and every food truck has at least one healthy option. Um, so we really are promoting activ physical activity, active transportation, so using your legs to get you places. And then our partners at um, Prodigal help us put on the event. So we're very, this is our fifth time to be on Northwest 23rd Street. We have a proclamation. Let's the clerk to read it. Whereas the city of Oklahoma City has prioritized the health and well-being of all its residents, and whereas active transportation promotes healthier residents with closer ties to their community, the more residents who choose active transportation, the greater, the greater impact we can have on halting the rise of obesity rates. Whereas Open Streets OKC reclaims part of a busy street for a few hours for non-motorized activity, everyone is invited to celebrate the recreational fun on Northwest 23rd Street, moving north into the Paseo District and meet local business owners as they walk, bike, skate, or board within the festive atmosphere of the Uptown and Paseo Business Districts of Oklahoma City. Whereas Oklahoma City County Health Department and its partners are hosting Open Streets OKC from noon to 4 p.m. on Sunday, April 8th on Northwest 23rd Street from Northwestern Avenue to North Robinson Avenue, on North Walker Avenue from Northwest 23rd Street to Northwest 28th Street, and on Paseo from Northwest 28th Street to Northwest 30th Street. Now therefore, Mick Cornett, the mayor of the city of Oklahoma City, does hereby proclaim April 8th, 2018 as Open Streets OKC Day in Oklahoma City. Let's show our appreciation for the people at the City County Board of Health. And, um, okay, April 8th, 4 o'clock. Noon to 4. Noon to four. Yeah, if they'd listened to me, they would have got there just for the time it ended noon to four, uh, and if someone was gonna come down and is unclear about where to park or where, what to do, what advice would you give? 
You can park at Oklahoma City University. Um, you can park at Wilson Elementary, Cleveland Elementary, and then is it First Presbyterian Church? Um, so on our website, we'll have a couple parking options. Wonderful. April 8th, great chance to get out and take a nice long walk, bring the kids. It's very family friendly and come hungry because there's going to be food trucks with lots of healthy options. Thanks for everything you all do. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. All right, I'll ask Philip Wen to come up. Philip, come on up here. I, I don't even have the correct number, but it's tens of thousands of teachers in the Oklahoma City metro area, and we've selected Philip as our Teacher of the Month. How about a round of applause for Philip? <laughs> Philip teaches in the Moore School District, and um, I mean, he doesn't just teach one class, he teaches everybody in the field of music. But you've, you've got to have a, lot, a good memory to remember all those kids' names. Uh, it is difficult, but yes. <laughs> uh, there's 550 names that, that roll around up here. And it, it starts at uh, kindergarten and goes all the way up through sixth grade. We're going to learn more about it with a resolution. I'll ask the clerk to read it. Pres, Philip Wynn has been named Teacher of the Month for March 2018 by the Moore Public Schools and the Rotary Club of Oklahoma City. Whereas Philip grew up in Duncan, Oklahoma, and was drawn to teaching by his high school band director, Jeremy Haas, also an educator. Whereas Philip graduated from Oklahoma University in 2013 with a bachelor's degree in music education, making both the Dean's Honor Roll and the President's Honor Roll. He also received his Master of Human Relations degree in 2015. Whereas Philip started his teaching career at Bryant Elementary in the Moore Public School District in 2014. Philip also works in a private music studio providing lessons for children and has worked with Infinity Music Arts Academy. Whereas Philip works diligently to develop curriculum and lessons that foster an atmosphere of excitement and interest to create an environment in which students feel comfortable with the creative elements of music. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Mayor and Council of the City of Oklahoma City that they do hereby recognize and commend Philip Wynn on his selection as the March 2018 Teacher of the Month by the Moore Public Schools and the Rotary Club of Oklahoma City. And, Philip, believe it or not, we're going to have to vote on this. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> so is there a motion? And a second? All right, cast your votes. Now we can applaud. It's unanimous. <laughs> Congratulations. Can you give me the microphone? Oh, sure. Um, real quick, I just want to give a quick thank you to uh, some of my biggest supporters, Ms. Stephanie Gunter, Grant Goodner. Uh, because of you guys, I get to do what I love, and uh, with your support, uh, I get to do it with excellence, uh, straight up. Uh, of course, my wife, Jordan Wynn, most beautiful woman I've ever met, miracle in my life. And then, uh, real quick, Mr. Mary Cornette, um, we all know it, it's quite an eventful time to be uh, a teacher in the state of Oklahoma right now. And for you to take a couple minutes this morning to genuinely take an interest in our school and what we're doing, uh, it, it's nothing short of amazing. So thank you so much for who you are and what you do. It's, it's, a, it's a small amount compared to the sacrifice that the teachers are making across the state. We have thousands of excellent teachers in Oklahoma City and in Oklahoma. And please pass along our best wishes to every one of them and how much we appreciate their work. All right, one more round of applause. And with uh, over 4,000 employees working for the city of Oklahoma City, you can imagine how difficult it might be to select one to be the, t uh, the employee of the month. But we work with the Oklahoma City Kiwanis Club to do that, and John Siska is our employee of the month. John, come on up. John works over at the Civic Center, um, and uh, you know almost everybody in Oklahoma City has been to the Civic Center at one time or another and, and uh, has uh, had an opportunity to, to view the wonderful people over there and the, and the the incredible uh, politeness that comes from the staff over there in, in trying to be helpful. Um, we have a resolution. I'll ask the clerk to read it. Whereas John Siska has been a unit operations supervisor at the Civic Center Music Hall for six years and was recently named acting performing arts manager. Whereas John supervises a range of activities including coordination of life safety training programs, oversight of material purchases and service contracts, project management of renovations and repair, energy efficiency and building automation upgrades,
communication with city departments to coordinate maintenance and logistics in the Bicentennial Park, as well as media interviews. Whereas thanks to John's leadership and character, Civic Center Music Hall employees take pride in their work, which shows through the well-maintained and organized flow of the building. Whereas John is a regular participant in the Reading Buddies program and a volunteer Taekwondo teacher. Whereas John promotes creativity within his staff while providing leadership and support, encouraging employees to use their skills and learn new ones. Whereas John is reliable, knowledgeable, and practical in the way he manages day-to-day -day operations, ensuring that the Civic Center Music Hall functions in the most efficient manner. Whereas this council desires to recognize John Siska for his dedication, professionalism, and commitment to the residents of the City of Oklahoma City, now therefore be it resolved by the Mayor and Council of the City of Oklahoma City that they do hereby thank and commend John Siska, March 2018, South Oklahoma City Qantas Club Employee of the Month. How about a round of applause for John? And, uh, we also have to vote on this, John, so uh, you can't take a deep breath yet. How about a motion and a second? Cast your votes. How about that? It's unanimous. Uh, and. Uh, I'm going to hand the microphone so you can uh, thank the appropriate people. But I also noticed you're a part of our Reading Buddies program. Would you explain what our Oklahoma City employees do on a volunteer basis in that program as well? Absolutely. I've been with Reading Buddies the second year after it started. The first year was uh, the selected group of managers and uh, directors. Basically, what we're trying to do is um, give the kids confidence and direction, you know, critique their reading, let them know that somebody really cares that is important that we spend time nutrying the kids and that it's, it's a valuable experience for everybody involved. And we're into the public schools and our employees. Exactly. Take time off. They, go over there. they take their time off, and volunteer, and a half hour a week with the children. Yes, all absolutely. Right. Now, we're all very proud of the Civic Center. Tell us about the fine folks over there. Well, <clears throat> Oklahoma City. Parks, uh, Civic Center. Obviously, I mean, there's a lot of wonderful employees, a lot of dedicated employees. You know, as managers, we're always looking to select employees, you know, to be nominated for an award of some type. Um, for the employees to nominate the manager, that's kind of special. I mean, I've, I had no clue this was coming. It was like a blind side when I found out about it. And then I found out who nominated me was Yolanda Ford and through the groups of the, uh, the Civic Center. But I really appreciate, you know, Mr. Cupper, his direction and leadership with the uh, Parks and Recreation and the Civic Center Music Hall. It is a wonderful place. If you have to go to work every day, that's not a bad place to go. It's really not. And I do appreciate it very much. Thank you. Tell me about uh, the volunteers that help make all the events possible. Okay. We have over 400 volunteers who are there for every single show, any event, whether it's a graduation, a uh, Broadway show, uh, a kids show, uh, volunteers rotate through. It's a large family of community, folks from the community who take their time to help usher and guide the patrons when they come to visit the Civic Center for, you know, various shows. Uh, it's really a huge dedication that we appreciate greatly. And if people want to be one of those volunteers, what do they need to do? They can contact myself or Donna Gatewood at the Civic Center Music Hall. All right, John Siska, thank you. All right, thank you. Our employee of the month. All right, we're on item three of the office of the mayor. I'll look for the uh, appointment of Steve Hill to the Lake Atoka Association. Your motion, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 
And I, D, E, and F will be moved into executive session. So I'll need a motion to do that. Individually, okay. How about item D then first? All right, cast your votes. That item moves to executive session. Item E. Okay. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. And item F. Is there a second? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. All right, item four is the journal of council proceedings. Item 4A is to receive the journal for February 27th. And item 4B is to approve the journal for February 13th. All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item five is a request for uncontested continuances. Mayor, just a couple this morning, starting on page nine. Page nine, item seven, Y. There's an error in that item. We need to strike it and bring it back. So that's strike item seven, Y on page nine. And then moving to page 24, under item nine, K1. C, 9628 Southeast 29th Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has removed. Item D, 921 Northeast 31st Street. We ask that that be stricken. We need to re-notify. Uh, moving to page 25 under item 9L1G, 2233 Northeast 21st Street. We ask that that be stricken. It's now occupied. Item H, 521 Northwest 27th Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item I, 721 Southwest 31st Street. We ask that that be stricken. It's now occupied. And then under item 9, M1, item H, 521 Northwest 27th Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. And finally, item I, 730, uh, 721 Southwest 31st Street. We ask that that be stricken. It is now occupied. Any other requests for uncontested continuances? All right, we'll move on to item six. This is revocable permits. Um, the first is with Eastern Technical Associates for the Visible Emissions and Certification Training. Is there anyone here representing that organization? All right, how about a motion? This event will uh, go through Ward 4 and Ward 6. So, okay, Meg? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. We're on to item 6B. This is a request, a request from OKCX Limited to hold the 2018 OKC River Trail Relay. Is there anyone here representing this organization? Yes, come on up. Good morning, Council. Good morning. I'm uh, Matthew Reynolds. I'm Vice President of OKCX. Uh, this will be our second year of holding the River Trail Relay. That's a multi-sport event down on the river. Um, it help, proceeds do help uh, the river, tra or river Trail Maintenance Fund, that kind of stuff. And this year we'll be adding a uh, new leg and activity. We're working with the Boathouse to add kayaking. In. So we'll have a cycling, running, and kayaking event down the river on May 20th. Any questions? I don't think so. Is the second year, the first year go well? Yes, it went very well. We had well, about uh, 200 participants. Um, it was just a running and cycling event at that time. And a uh, fun time was had by all. Well, thanks for your efforts. Hope you have a good turnout. Thank you. All right, how about a motion on item 6B? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Thank you. Item 6C is a request with the Energy FC to hold the O City St. Patrick's Day Parade. And uh, Billy Walton is here. Hi, Billy. Come on up. I like your St. Patrick's Day tie Thank you. there. I'm getting in the spirit a little early. Yeah. Uh, but never too really, honestly. I'm, I'm Billy Walton. I'm with Prodigal and Energy FC, and we're hosting uh, the O City St. Patrick's Day Parade. This will be our fifth year to do it. We took a, a year off last year, but we're back at it and ready to kick off St. Patrick's Day uh, in downtown Oklahoma City, and also kick off our uh, season uh, for the 2018 USL season as OKC Energy FC against the Tulsa Roughnecks on Saturday night as well. So, be a fun, family-friendly event. Uh, we're, we're welcoming everybody to come down. Make sure you wear your green, and if you have Energy FC gear. You're already in your green, so it'll be a great time for everybody. Yeah, sounds like it. How about a motion then on item 6C? Second. All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Thank you all very Thanks, much. Billing. Good luck to the energy. Uh -huh. Item 6D is a request with the OKC Dodgers Baseball Foundation to hold the OKC Dodgers Community Run. Anyone here representing the Dodgers? Come on up. Good morning. Good morning. Good. My name is Michael Burns. I'm the board president for the um, foundation. So we will be uh, starting the morning on the 31st with a run. There's a 5K, a 1K, and a fun run. Uh, the unique thing about this run is we will actually be completing the run on the field. 
Um, so they'll come through the, um, the maintenance area onto the warning track and around near home plate. So it should make for a unique finish uh, for this run. That'll lead into a, an open event that we have our Fan Fest later that morning for kicking off the season as we get closer to April 10th, our opening day. Wonderful, Mike. Thanks for, for putting all this together. Um, and I, uh, what, what is your op opening game? April 10th. April 10th. Do you know who will be in town for that game? Well, we, no, oh, I, the opponent? Uh -huh. will be playing the Round Rock Express. We don't know who our roster is going to be, but we From know who Texas. the opponent is going to be. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Got to go to spring training. That's right. That's right. Is there a, a motion? Seven. All right. We're voting on item 6D. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Thank you. Michael, Thanks. did you find some good candidates for the national anthem? We did. We had some great candidates, more than we can uh, place. So we're pleased with that. Fantastic. Item 6E is a request to hold the Open Streets OKC, and this is the um, event that we highlighted earlier. Uh, but we still need a motion on this, don't we, to make it official? How about a motion then on item uh, 6E? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. And item 6F is a request from Ultramax Sports, Ultramax Sports, to hold the Go Girl Run 5K and Half Marathon. Is there anyone here representing this event? Come on up. This event will be March 24th. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, yeah. Council Members. Uh, this will be our fourth event here in Oklahoma City. It is the Go Girl Run Women's Half Marathon and 5K. It'll actually be our third year in Bricktown. Um, the event is a women's only event and it focuses on wellness and sisterhood and um, it encourages ladies to get out there for their very first maybe run 5k or they're taking the next step to do a half marathon and um, we are expecting about 2,000 at least uh, ladies from over 10 states to participate again and we're looking forward to a really great event again this year. How many do you expect will participate? Um, we're hoping, we're looking at about 2,200. Oh wow. Well, good luck. We really appreciate you putting all that together. Is there a motion on item 6F? All right, cast your votes. Pass unanimously. Thank you. Thanks and good luck. All right, we'll recess the council meeting, convene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. Five items. Comments or questions on the MFA? All right, cast your votes. MFA passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCMFA, convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. Three items. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Comments or questions about the PPA? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCPPA, convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Comments or questions here? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCEAT and reconvene the council meeting with the consent docket. Are there any individual considerations? I would like to discuss item X, please, Mayor. X, all right. Mayor, I'd like to mention uh, 7AR. AD. AB. No, okay. D as in dog. D. And okay. then uh, AG, one, two, and three. And do you have a presentation? Mayor, we have two presentations this morning on items AE and AF. Okay, well, let's have those first. Okay, first up is, is uh, with the Oklahoma City Public School District. Scott Randall and Rebecca Kay are here this morning. Scott is the, uh, in, been with the district about 17 years. Uh, used to be the CFO and really brought the financials of the district in to clean audits and has been over operations for a couple of years. Rebecca Kay is the uh, newly appointed uh, acting superintendent and uh, uh, she's very bright she's very passionate and she has a really hard job so uh, so uh, give 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 her a nice deference this morning as, as we go forward great well um, we are so grateful to be here thank you so much for considering um, this to funding request um, what we are doing and we've been working um, in concert closely with manager couch to think through what it would look like to have a long-range facilities master plan for oklahoma city public schools 
Um, so this request is really related to us being able to fulfill the promises that we've been making to our school board and to the public. The estimated cost of the facilities master plan um, work, which will include a facilities assessment as well as some work related to kind of re, um, redrawing boundaries and some other things like that, is $1.2 million. The last assessment that we had of this kind, um, the city helped us with, uh, and it was related to the Maps for Kids project. So um, this project will update our school board on it on a regular basis, and we'll be publishing information publicly about this throughout the course of the process. And I'm going to turn it over to Scott to talk about the Operations Center. And good morning, and again, thank you for the opportunity to present this request to the City Council. Um, uh, just continuing forward as far as what we're looking for is in, the, in the funding request, we're looking to make upgrades at our operations center. It's located at I-35 and Northeast 23rd Street. Um, the operations center has been excluded from bond authorizations for the past 20 plus years, and so it's, it's been a challenge as far as just maintaining the condition and, and the facility itself uh, as it's aged out. And so uh, what we're looking at is replacing a 51-year-old security fence, uh, and you'll see the pictures, and it's kind of hard to take pictures of a fence because you're mainly shooting air, uh, but if you'll scroll to the next slide, uh, you can see it's, a, again, it's, it's somewhat of a liability from a security perspective uh, that we have made patches on top of patches as far as the fence is concerned. Uh, on the upper right-hand corner, you can see a picture, and again, it, I'm shooting air mainly, but uh, that's a patch that I can basically walk through if that patch was not there standing up. I wouldn't have to bend over. I wouldn't have to crawl through it. I could walk directly through it. So the fence has been cut, and that's actually the Katy Trail that you see behind it there. It's been hit numerous times on the Miramar side uh, because we border Miramar on the west boundary. And so uh, the fence has been damaged. We've lost barbed wire in the top. Uh, again, it's been cut. So we're looking to upgrade the fence or replace the fence. And then the second piece, and... Um, I apologize, I'm the photographer here, but bear with me. Um, uh, we haven't done any type of significant upgrade as far as the interior roadways are concerned. And so you can see some stretches there that have significant cracking, uh, significant potholes uh, that have been paved uh, or been attempted to be repaired. Uh, it's quite rough as far as trying to drive your vehicle or to take one of our new school buses uh, that we just purchased as part of the 2016 authorization. And so. Uh, trying to make sure that we just keep our roadways in good condi condition and, and that we prevent any type of damage to district vehicles and personal vehicles. And so looking at just a paving project that uh, is long overdue. Relocation of our IT server room. Uh, it is currently located at the Bryan Research Center. Uh, as you may know, we vacated our administration building at 9th and Klein uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, we're temporarily housing... I'm sorry? Not quite a year ago. Not quite a year ago. Uh, we're temporarily housing, and I stress temporarily housing our administrative functions at uh, Northeast Academy and also at the Operations Center. So we've kind of split those operations up that were previously housed under one roof. Uh, but we left our IT department at the Bryan Research Center. And so we, that's a facility that is in need of substantial repairs, it, and it, it's similar to our admin building. Uh, we need to find a new location for that. And so uh, we're looking at relocating that the first quarter of 2020. It houses our IT server room and the costs associated with the connectivity that's necessary for that to support 80 schools uh, is quite costly. And so we're asking for, again, funding for that. We're looking at options. 615 Classen is one of those options. It would not be in the basement. Uh, kind of leading the pack is our operations center. And then also looking at school or co-location at uh, or an external hosting not situation. So uh, that's our funding request as far as the relocation of the IT server room. And this is out of TIF 2, and we have an allocation in a number of the TIFs that are for the taxing agencies. And so the county's taken uh, an allocation of this in the past, and this is a $5 million allocation out of those TIF funds for the Oklahoma State Public School District. And what's the total budget for the public school allocation from TIF 2? I don't think it's set up for, 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 come on up, Brent. It's set up for other taxing jurisdictions. Is it allocated, is it divided per those jurisdictions? Uh, originally, um, uh, the, school, the school district, right now the budget is $21 million. And with the allocation of this $5 million here, we will exhaust the entire amount of allocation. We've already, we allocated approximately $10 million about a year ago um, to them. Um, and so in the last year we've allocated with this, it'll be $15 million in total. 
So all, all 21 million is, is spent after this allocation? Well, the budget will be have allocated, yes, sir. Okay, thanks. Well, we appreciate you coming down today. And uh, off, uh, off to the side, thanks for all the work you all are doing inside the schools. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Next is item AF. We have a presentation uh, from Brent Bone regarding the uh, Pioneer Switch House project. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm with uh, Tribune. We're a local development group uh, based here in Oklahoma City uh, here this morning to talk about uh, a project we're calling Central Exchange uh, and our TIF request um, to help out with that project. Um, so this is uh, two buildings located at 7 and 11 Northeast 6th Street. It's the former Pioneer Telephone uh, Warehouse and Garage um, and we're working with HMM Architects and Lingo Construction on a development plan to reposition uh, these two buildings for mixed use, retail and office use. Um, next slide, thanks. Uh, so the property you can see there uh, is, is the property in question. It's on the north side of 6th, right next to the railroad. Um, actually, when the railroad went uh, to quiet zone, that's actually what encouraged us to, to kind of jump in with uh, development in this area. So we purchased the property um, in early 2017. I've been working on a development plan since then. Uh, our plan is to uh, remove some of the dilapidated del uh, elements on the property. The property has been mostly abandoned. AT and we purchased the property from AT&T again early last year um, <clears throat> and um, they used it essentially as kind of a service office. They had a few people working out of it but mostly unoccupied um, for the last decade or so. Uh, so our plan would be to replace the windows um, with uh, windows consistent with the character of the historic building, uh, introduce some courtyards, um, Build, we, we're building a north glass and steel addition on the back side of the three-story warehouse building, also regrading and resurfacing the lot, um, improving the lot um, for parking, bringing more parking spaces to the site as well. One of the things we're most excited about for this project is actually um, a pedestrian walkway. So we're, currently there's um, an alleyway between the warehouse and the garage building. Um, we plan to turn that into a pedestrian path, so it will no longer be accessible for vehicle access. So we'll encourage parking to come around the corner via 7th, uh, and that alleyway uh, we'll use to create a pedestrian promenade that links 6th Street to 7th Street. So with this project, our goal really is to improve walkability um, in, in, in the city and also create a destination that um, is just kind of a public amenity that anybody can use. Um, so. The original buildings are 37,300 square feet. We're only adding a small amount of square footage. The total will be 41,300 with about 15,000 square foot of retail and the remainder being um, some upper floor office space. Uh, next slide. These are a few um, renderings of the project and that um, just give you a sense for what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so we do plan to list these buildings on the National Registry of Historic Places um, and uh, you can see that the 6th Street frontage remains mostly as its historical appearance. Uh, we, we plan to kind of repair it, fix it up, and uh, retuck point the brick and, and put the windows in that represent the historic look and feel of the buildings. But you can really get a sense of the, the pedestrian path there that, that is between the two buildings. We think it creates a walkable, active environment, a social place, uh, and um, really sets the tone for development in this mostly un un underdeveloped area between Broadway and Oklahoma Avenue on 6th Street. Uh, next slide. Uh, we've got a few, few reasons we've listed for why this project uh, we think is, is deserving of TIF. One, we view this as a gateway to downtown. Um, so as you know, 6th Street, there's an exit right off I-235 there. Um, and, um, an off-ramp for I-235. So a lot of traffic drives right by, by this, this property on its way into Midtown or Automobile Alley or the Downtown Central Business District. Uh, and there's several underdeveloped lots surrounding the property. So we think by doing this right and building a really good piece of city, we can set the tone for development in the area. Um, and so um, we really wanna do that. Uh, we're surrounded by a number of lots. We've heard of some great activities starting to, to pop up in the area and we're, we're excited to start and set the tone to do this right. 
Um, we are, number two, we do plan to bring a lot of restaurant and retail. We're talking to several tenants right now uh, who we think will be a great fit for the area, um, drive uh, income tax sales or sales tax growth, uh, et cetera. Um, and we'll be bringing plenty of parking to the table to support, to support that restaurant and retail space. Number three is the, most, the reason we're most excited. Sixth uh, and Seventh Street, we want to improve walkability. Uh, and again, connect 6th and 7th with that walkable um, pathway through the site. Currently, 6th Street is in pretty poor shape. There's a retaining wall there. Um, on 6th Street, that's where the road dips underneath um, the BNSF Railroad. Um, and uh, as it dips down, we have a retaining wall that's currently falling into the street. And so we, we have quite a bit we need to do to, to repair and fix that up, improve walkability and safety in the area, and also we want to landscape it and make it um, look really nice and create, create a good walkable piece of city. So, And again, we think this property is deserving because we're revitalizing a historic property. Um, we acquired the buildings from AT&T. They've always been in the AT&T family. AT&T um, acquired them when they acquired Southwestern Bell, who acquired them when they acquired Pioneer Telephone. At one time, they served as a switch house where the operators would actually um, um, route the calls on the switchboards as they received calls. And our name for the development, Central Exchange, actually stems from the fact that um, what back in the days of the six-digit telephone number, you would dial 23 for CE to route your telephone call in and out of Oklahoma City. So um, quick highlight on the project costs. Uh, the total cost for the project is $11.2 million. We acquired the property for just under $2.5 uh, and most of the cost is allocated to hard costs and architect fees of uh, just over 8.1 million, um, bringing that total cost to 11.2 million. So um, that is um, all I have. Again, we're requesting a TIF in the amount of 300,000, um, and happy to open it up to any questions at this point. Tell me the estimated completion date again. Should be early 2019. And then you mentioned other development, new development in the area. I saw in the paper this morning about a new hotel that's going in on 6th Street. Is it in close proximity to you, or do you? It know? is in. I just saw that article as well. It is in close proximity. They're right on 6th and Broadway. We're a little bit further east, but very close. Great selection of an architect. Yep, we're excited. They've done a great job. Yep, do a fantastic job on that. I can't wait to see what you do with the arched window up at the top of the oh yeah it's very beautiful building. it's gonna, it's just great space thanks for taking it on but i do hope you're going to be able to work with the railroad to deal with the number of vehicles that routinely get stuck mm -hmm. underneath that bridge you're going to need to work some lighting or signage or mm -hmm. something to help that yeah yeah we do have uh, some 18 wheelers that do get stuck underneath yeah. underneath there sometimes and have to back up and yeah. <laughs> slow up some traffic unfortunately all right. So is that is three hundred thousand the amount that you requested, or is that the negotiated? That'd be the negotiated amount. We originally requested a little bit more, and the three hundred thousand is is kind of what we've agreed on, um, um, mostly to go towards uh, helping us out with creating, improving the Sixth Street sidewalk and uh, the walkable pedestrian area. So th this would be less than, or this would be less than three percent. As opposed to our customary six to seven percent, is there a reason? As on all projects, we do them based as based upon evaluation of the performance and the dollars needed to, to complete the project. Okay. This one just needed less. Okay. Thanks. Thanks and good luck. Thank you. And Mayor, the last presentation this morning is on a unique uh, item. It's item A D, and it's a, uh, a resolution supporting an inner jurisdictional uh, agreement with the cities, uh, amongst the cities of Bethany, War Acres, and Yukon to revitalize the historic Route 66 corridor uh, along that area. And Aubrey is here to talk to us about it. Good morning, Aubrey McDermott, Planning Director. Um, this opportunity to focus on one of our historic assets in the state is very exciting for me as a planner, but um, Oklahoma City has a, a large stretch of the Route 66 corridor. And a really interesting piece of that stretch actually happens west of the I-44 interchange and goes in and out of other jurisdictions, including Bethany, Yukon, and War Acres. And that's the divided boulevard where uh, 39th Street exists. A lot of great land uses along that corridor and lots of great opportunity. So um, 
Back in October, these four municipalities started meeting to discuss opportunities to look at revitalizing the corridor with different approaches in terms of investments to the corridor itself, making it more attractive, making it a, more of an economic development opportunity and a community opportunity for people to uh, experience Route 66 and have places to go and gather. So this is just the first step in acknowledging that these four municipalities really want to focus on revitalization of the corridor, working together, working with partners and other agencies to look for different resources and grant uh, funding and opportunities for the community to help reinvest in and uh, revitalize this great historic asset that we have. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about some of the things that we've been discussing since October and where we might go. Um, we, we are talking to ODOT because this corridor is under the jurisdiction of ODOT and we're talking to og &E about potential partnership and improvements that we could do using those resources as well. Yeah, I mean, th this, is a, this is a cool uh, deal that I, I hadn't even heard of until now, so I, I would like to be part of the process, so just keep me up to date. Uh, um, I would like to come to meetings and wh whatever to, to help with the discussion. Thank you. Yeah. Aubrey, there's also been some talk over many, many years about creating a, like a historic business loop or a downtown business loop or something off of 23rd Street that might take you downtown and back out. And right. is there any consideration for some of those ideas? Yeah, we have several of our commercial business districts that would like to enhance people's knowledge of our Route 66 corridor through our urban areas as well. Um, the city of Tulsa has done some work too in adopting ordinances lately to help relax sign uh, regulations so that you can in reinstate some of those great neon Route 66-esque signs. Um, helping to encourage facade enhancements and improvements and really uh, start to put some uh, historic markers along the corridor. Those are some of the things we've discussed in the urban area that can really help people tie into where Route 66 originally was and where it's going. Great. I know that early on the Automobile Alley Board had some ideas about trying to direct some right. traffic some way, so you might Tulsa's, connect with them. Tulsa's done a good job, too, kind of memorializing that and, and creating some codes that would be very easy for Oklahoma City to look to as an example of something that we could do. All right. Any other comments or questions? All right. Thank you. Aubrey, thanks. Is that it? It is. Okay. Uh, we have uh, three council people that had asked to speak about individual items on the consent docket. Uh, Todd, you want to get started with item X? Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to, to uh, mention item X quickly. Uh, this is a repaving job southeast 104th from Bryant to South Sooner. Um, and I've often held this road up as potentially one of the worst in Oklahoma City. I, I haven't even driven it in a year because it's pretty, pretty rough. Uh, so I guess I'll have to find a different street to <laughs> trade around. But uh, this is a joint joint effort between Cleveland County and Oklahoma City and I would like to express my thanks, my personal thanks uh, to both Cleveland County and the staff at Oklahoma City to be able to work together and get this accomplished. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Meg, you wanted to talk about item AR? Yeah, thank you, Mary. This is another um, cooperative effort. Um, just want to recognize the memor memorandum of understanding with the Oklahoma City River Run Riverfront Redevelopment Authority and the Oklahoma City Community Foundation. Um, Community Foundation has a fabulous trust called the Margaret Annis Boyce Trust that um, is set up to do landscape and beautification projects, and they are working with the Riverfront Authority to landscape, do both landscape um, and hardscape improvements with um, some sidewalks and benches and things along the north side of the river between uh, Portland, South Portland and South Harvey. So it's a slightly different area and encouraging people to use our trails and walk all along the river. So we're very grateful for the community foundation's support of this. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Ja, let's see. James, you want to speak about AD, AG123? Yeah, uh, AD was the um, uh, Route 66 item, so I don't need to say anything on it. Um, and AG1 and one, two, and three are is just the TIF allocation for 
for the uh, um, convention center hotel uh, for the from TIFF 13 to and eight. Eight. And so uh, I don't really have anything to say about it. I just, I just, I just like to vote on it separately. Those are the allocations that were approved in the funding plan that was previously, as we're just implementing those, the funding plan that was previously approved. Right. All right, so that's AG 1, 2, and 3. James, you'd like to vote on separately? Okay. All right, uh, how about a, a motion then on AG 1, 2, and 3 separately? Separate. All right, cast your votes, and it passes six to two and then how about a, a motion on the rest of the consent docket we can. all right cast your votes it passes unanimously all right we're on to the concurrence docket all right are there any individual considerations All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. And that moves us on to item nine. These are items that require a separate vote. We'll start with a series of zoning cases. The first is an ABC issue in Ward 6. The address is 1201 West Reno Avenue. It's, uh, it's an ABC issue, Meg. Okay. Good morning. My name is Josh Livingston. I'm uh, the owner of the, the property at 1201 West Reno and been working with my tenant, Bad Axe Throwing, who is a Canadian company currently operating 20 uh, axe throwing locations between uh, the United States and Canada. They're also the founder of the World Axe Throwing League, which is an international league that allows people to compete, keep track of scores, etc. They also provide consultation to uh, axe throwing uh, establishments across the world in terms of safety and protocols and, and how to set this thing up. So this is a, uh, a lumberjack sport brought to the retail level that has uh, become very popular. There are nine U.S. locations in addition to Oklahoma City, uh, Denver, San Francisco, two in Chicago, Washington, D.C., Atlanta. I believe there are five locations in addition to that opening this year in the U.S. They're applying for um, a liquor license to serve beer. The plan is to serve a can of beer from local uh, breweries, Anthem or uh, Stone Cloud, something in the neighborhood, as we try to work on um, sort of pocket over there in the farmer's market district. Um, there's a plan for a two drink limit. Um, the idea is like going bowling or hanging out playing pool or throwing darts that People like to have a couple of beers. This is an establishment that is not open at any hour, so you book an event. And so this is mostly people booking a birthday party or an office get-together. Uh, Dell, for example, has already had several uh, company events there. And so you, you book ahead, uh, you fill out forms, and you pay for it and show up at a, an allotted time, and it's a two-and-a-half-hour event. Um, so it's not a drinking establishment outside of a booked planned event. And Oklahoma's not a, uh, they, they have some of their locations where BYOB laws are in effect. I think Indianapolis is one of them, for example, um, where people just kind of bring their own food and, and bring whatever they'd like to drink. But they're applying for a license so that they can allow people to, um, to buy a couple of beers there while they have their event. Right now, people cater their own food, bring it in or, or have it delivered. They've got tables and things uh, set up for that. There is an active throwing area. Uh, Meg was able to come by Saturday and, and toss an axe or two. <laughs> and uh, so there's, there's an active throwing area where you're- There's you're, no evidence of it. <laughs> had you had a beer It's all been destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> so there's an active throwing area where you step into uh, uh, lanes that are walled off uh, with steel cages. And that's where you do your throwing with a, a uh, coach who, who manages the event. And then separate from that is the eating and uh, 
where you would uh, be drinking and um, that area is separated. So just like you can't uh, go bowl with a beer in your hand, once you step down into that area, it's a similar setup as that. Um, the staffing is a, uh, a coach who trains the people on throwing the axes and handles it depending on your skill level or what you want to do in the event. You can get pretty creative with different things you can do. There's a separate employee that uh, serves the alcohol uh, behind a bar. There's a stand-up refrigerator with sliding glass doors and, and there'll be a couple different Anthem beers in there. The type of liquor license is a, a beer and wine license and um, as I mentioned they have a a two ticket drink something where you know you, you get two tickets you can get two drinks and then, and then that's it um, so I I think that's great Josh I just added I, I wasn't able to, to get this from from Jesse who's their operations director in Toronto but he did send me a letter that they'd be happy to make their loss run reports active in their six years in business they have zero safety incidents uh, at any of their locations and be happy to make their insurance loss runs uh, available if that was needed. I know this is a new concept, so a lot of questions. Well, I thank you for hosting me on Saturday. I really was interested to go take a look. I had a little trouble visualizing what this concept was like, but having seen it, and you know, there are uh, there are lanes just like there are in bowling with walls that go all the way up to the top where the actual axe throwing is done. Only two people stand there at one time. They're counted down to throw the axes, so you wouldn't be, you know, throwing them at different times. Um, I really was impressed with the staff. Uh, they appear to have a very good safety protocol, and um, all things being said, I would move approval of the application. All right, cast your votes. Question? Yes. In, in reading this, I'm a little confused. Uh, an ABC3, does that not allow mixed drinks, uh, Kenny? Yes. So we're not talking about just something that serves beer and wine. We're talking about something that serves the total spectrum of alcohol. There, there will be no liquor served. Meg, Meg and I had an exchange about this, and, and I don't know if there was some confusion with how we worked with Cindy on how this ended up having to, to go. In, in terms of the route, because uh, this has taken a few different avenues, whether we needed to do a spud for this because of the proximity of the building to an old R3 zoning, but the applicant will be getting a beer and wine license from ABC. Larry, you still have to get a permit underneath this. The only zoning that permits you to sell any kind of alcohol without serving food is an ABC3. But within that, you have to get either a beer license that I think is beer and wine, or you can also get a mixed beverage license. And they are not going to apply for that mixed beverage license they're only going to serve beer. Because our ABC 1, 2, and 3 is based on percentages of, of alcohol, alcohol and food, food. Ratios, right? And okay. so this is the only option other than doing a spud, and they went this direction. So in, in concluding my question then, Meg, can they serve mixed alcohol there or not? I don't believe they could do it without a, going ahead to the next step and applying for a mixed beverage license. But you are correct that it does go with the property. So if the property were to change hands and become a restaurant, this ABC license would go with it. And it's only for this suite also. It's not the entire building. So it's only this, this one space oh, that one this space. is covering. All right, ready to vote? Cast your votes. And it passes seven to one. Thank you. Book your next city council event at Bad Axe Throwing, guys. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You'd be throwing at each other, most likely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Item nine A two is a zoning case in Ward Four, at one zero two two zero South Sunny Lane Road. It's currently Double A Agricultural, and it would become an I one Light Industrial District if approved. Todd. Has anyone uh, signed up to speak? Uh, thank you, Mayor. This was approved. Uh, this was approved unanimously at the uh, Planning Commission, um, and it's a it's a use that already exists in the area. So, with that, I'll just move for approval. All right. We have a motion and a second. We're voting on item nine A two. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Item 9A3 is a zoning case in Ward 6 at 2645 Southwest 25th Street. It's currently R1 single family residential and it would become an O1 limited office district if approved. Meg? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, the purpose of this uh, <clears throat> is to permit an office development um, on Southwest 25th Street. There were no protests at the Planning Commission and it was found to be in conformity with the uh, comprehensive plan. I would move approval. Okay, we have a motion and a second. We're voting on item 9A3. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 9A4 is a zoning case in Ward 7 at 11900 North Coltrane Avenue. It's currently inside a plan unit development district and it would be in a new PUD if approved. Is there anyone here representing this? Your Honor, John asked yeah, me to go present ahead. this and I'll present it. it it's uh, on ordinance on final hearing. Uh, the rezoning is to permit duplex residential development. Uh, it went before the Planning Commission, was unanimously approved, and there are no protests, so I'd move for its approval. All right, we're voting on item 9A4. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9A5 is a zoning case in Ward 3 at 12431 Northwest 4th Street. It's currently inside a PUD, and it would be a new PUD if it's approved. Larry? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, is the applicant present? <coughs> If you would just give a brief overview of, of what this is. This was unanimously approved by the Planning Commission. Has anybody signed up? No, sir. But it's interesting if you would. Mark Grubbs, 1819 South Morgan Road, on behalf of the applicant. Um, <clears throat> this is just an expansion of basically the PUD to the east. It's uh, directly behind the market at Check Hall, uh, the academy, and uh, uh, several growing businesses in that area. Um, the uh, we agreed uh, to the TEs and uh, removed a few uses at the request of the Planning Commission. We would just ask for your approval. And the market at Check Hall is doing very well. It's really taken off, hasn't it, Mark? Yeah, there are uh, several restaurants coming in, uh, Cheddar's and uh, a few others, uh, I think, um, are coming in. And uh, very busy, very busy area out on the western part of Oklahoma City with the uh, Mustang, Yukon, Oklahoma City. And it is, for those of you who need a little reminder on geography, it is in Oklahoma City. Yes, correct. I move for approval. Second. All right, we're voting on item 9A5. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 9A6 is a zoning case in Ward 2 at 3130 North Barnes Avenue. It's currently R1 single family, and it would become a spud if approved. Ed? Does anybody sign up to speak? Yes, is the applicant here? I guess, I mean, I'm a little confused because on the front it says protest none, and then on the second page of our handout it says there were protesters present. Um, so three planning commissioners were absent that day. The, the front of the, the memo, that's written protest. There's no written protest, but they did have protesters at the they were, planning commission meeting. I mean, I, no legal protest. No legal protest. I see. There are, were people that came to show up to the meeting. That, I mean, I, I guess if nobody showed up here, I mean, that settles it. But this is, I can't imagine this. They're taking this 7,000 square foot lot and basically putting three houses on one lot where everything else in the neighborhood is clearly one house per lot. But I guess if nobody signed up to, to speak, I'll move for approval. All right, we're voting on item 9A6. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 9A7 is a zoning case in Ward 1 at 10709 North Rockwell Avenue. It's currently inside of a spud, and it would be a new spud if approved. James? Yeah, the, the new spud is uh, exactly the same as the old one, except it just adds a uh, retail sales. It was had unanimous planning uh, approval, and uh, if nobody signed up. I'll move for approval. All right, we're voting on item 9A7. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 9A8 is a zoning case in Ward 5 at 11521 Southwestern Avenue. It's currently inside of a spud, and it would be a new spud if approved. David? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so this spud currently uh, is zoned to accommodate this type of facility, but when this spud was first approved about three years ago, it was approved specif specifically for a certain retailer. And now they would like to 
not the same retailer. They've decided to move uh, and build a facility elsewhere. But now the uh, new developers would like to expand it and, in a sense, double the size. And I think we have a picture of the rendering towards the back, possibly. It's in a fairly uh, commercial area of Southwestern, uh, and there were no protesters at the uh, Planning Commission. It was approved unanimously, and uh, so I would recommend uh, approval for this. I think it will fit in well in the area. Mm -hmm. All right, we're voting on item 9A8. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Thank you. Item 9B is a uh, request for a special permit. It's in Ward 1. It uh, has to do with the uh, Surrey Hills and the golf course close by. James? It, is the developer here? Yeah. I just had uh, maybe two questions. Uh, how many holes is this expansion? Nine. Nine? It's nine. It'll okay. tie back into the original 18 in the same clubhouse. Okay, so there will be 27 total mm -hmm. holes after this expansion. Okay, and the, the use is already correct. This is just a permit to allow. Right. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, that was all I had. Did anybody sign up? Okay. I'm, I'll move for approval. All right. We're voting on item 9B1. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 9B2 is a zoning case in Ward 3, and this is a, a middle school use in a double A agricultural district. It's in Ward 3, Larry. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Um, Ward 3. A lot of Ward 3 uses them. the Mustang school system, which is very popular because of their quality of education. So there have been a number of schools go up in Ward 3 uh, over the last several years. And all of those schools have a common denominator other than giving good quality education. They all seem to be able to attract a considerable emotion when it comes to getting the kiddos to school and from school using automobiles and buses. And so uh, what I asked was that, that the folks from the Mustang schools come in with their uh, representative, uh, David Box, <coughs> give us a little presentation on how this particular school, uh, when, when open, will provide different types of ingress and egress than some of the ones previously. Uh, as you go down the list of, of schools in, in Ward 3, uh, and you go to uh, Southwest 15th between Mustang and Sarah, Sarah Road between uh, 29th and 44th, uh, Morgan Road at 29th, uh, Southwest 15th near Check Hall. Each one of these has really gotten some emotion over the years uh, with the traffic situation. And so this is an attempt to brief the folks out there of what's been done and what the hope is. So David, if you would please, sir. Sure, David Box, 522 Call Core Drive here on behalf of the applicant. Also with me is Mr. Charles Bradley, who's the Deputy Superintendent of Mustang Schools. Um, so our special permit is to construct a middle school south of Southwest 44th Street. Uh, what makes this one different from some of the other schools that have created some, some traffic issues, as the councilman um, mentioned, uh, over here on my right, on the far, the, the aerial, that is a school off of, of 15th Street. And the reason I, I want to show that is to show the difference in that school compared to what we're doing here. Uh, the biggest difference is the length of uh, lineal feet that this school is set back. So in total, the middle school that we propose here has 3,960 lineal feet of queuing space for cars. And so you have dedicated bus lanes, as you see here, and then dedicated you know, parent drop-off lanes that are a great distance from 44th and then allow double stacking here at the drop-off point. Over here off the south on 15th Street, it's about 600 feet. And so you can see uh, the vast difference in queuing space that will pull the cars off of 44th Street. The other benefit that the city has in this case is that last January, um, this council put into effect the, the impact fee ordinance. Uh, we calculate approximately $185,000 that the school sites here off of 44th will generate in impact fees. Uh, in addition, off 44th Street and uh, at Mustang Road, which is a half mile to our east, uh, there is an ODOT project happening in, in which a traffic signal will be installed uh, either uh, late spring or early summer, but certainly before the start of the school year next fall. Uh, so all those things considered, we do believe that we have adequate measures in place um, to protect against traffic problems as, as they may be created, um, primarily due to the excessive length of queuing that we have on site. Thank you, David. One of the things 
One of the things that uh, David mentioned was a traffic signal at uh, Southwest 44th and Mustang Road. And if you're a driver in Ward 3, you would recognize that spot because unfortunately it is the number one hotspot for serious, serious accidents. And uh, I've asked Eric Winger just to give the folks an update of where we stand on getting that signalization done. Thank you, Councilman. The project that uh, Councilman McAtee mentions at Southwest 44th and Mustang is actually one that started the planning process several years ago, and we had applied for multiple grants. It was not a funded bond project, so we started looking for additional resources. We had received the first grant, but it had fallen through, so fortunately, with ODOT's assistance, we were able to secure a second grant. The project was originally committed and one we wanted to finish last year, but just due to funding restrictions and some things, it was suspended until just this last couple of months. And so at the commission meeting here on March 5th, um, the ODOT commission did, uh, did approve this, and so it's a contract with MidState. Um, and as mentioned by David, it's expected to be in construction within about the next 90 days. ODOT does a 90-day flexible start that allows their contractors to schedule their work based on some of their other work and workloads. We would expect it to be under construction by summer um, and probably be completed within another 60 to 90 days. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. So the Mustang schools and, and our public works are working together have tried to address all of the issues that we know right now as far as ingress and egress and to make this a significant improvement over some of the installations we've had in the past. I thank the folks from Mustang coming down. Would you all like to say something or? Just briefly, Charles Bradley, uh, Mustang Schools, 3125 Ham uh, Hampshire Lane. And to address Mr. McAtee's uh, concern, I live right there at 29th and Morgan Road, which is a hot spot, so I hear it all the time. So, but, but we work through it. The thing I would like to add to that is from the Canyon Ridge Intermediate School on between 29th and 44th on Sarah Road, th there is a, a lot of lessons learned. And so one of the lessons is to engage. Oklahoma City Police Department has been wonderful meeting with us month by month, and they've offered to help us and so we can preempt this by educating the community in that area of the routes and stuff. So we want to be proactive in every sense of the word of the potential traffic there. That's it. Unless the uh, council has some questions. I, one, I haven't heard a mention of a safe room being constructed. Yes, sir. Uh, yes every, every new building will have a safe room in it. The okay. middle school, the elementary, and the intermediate. Just making sure. Thanks. Yeah. Seeing no questions, I move for approval. All right. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Item 9C is to uh, close a drainage easement in Ward 1 at 9008 Scarlet Boulevard. James, you okay with this? Yeah. Not, I don't know of any protesters, so I'll move for approval. Okay. Cast your votes on 9C. Passed unanimously. And 9C2 is a, an easement uh, off of Grand Boulevard. Ed, you okay with that? Yeah. All right. Is there a second? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. All right, item 9D. This is our second public hearing. This would implement the, the funding plan that the council adopted six months ago. Has to do with the uh, hotel that accompanies the right. convention center. And, and we had a public hearing two weeks ago, too, and Kathy O'Connor gave a presentation at that time. All right. All right, it is a public hearing if anybody would like to speak. All right. Now, what is it? Can you reiterate that one more time? What is this about? I was almost asleep. <laughs> no. Now, Mayor, could you reiterate that again? What's this about? This is a public hearing, and it implements the funding plan the council adopted six months ago for the Omni Hotel. Oh, Lord, yes, I sure want to speak on that. Oh, okay. no. Oh, no. Michael Washington, 2900 Northeast 18th Street. We say no to this Omni Hotel. That's right. It is a preposterous idea blatantly designed to rob the citizens, like myself, of hard-earned taxpayers' dollars that could be directed toward our dilapidated school structure and communities. 
This is a blatant attempt by the wealthy of downtown Oklahoma City folk who live in more Nichols Hills and all those fabulous places. Of course, I don't have the money to even brush the street car there. This needs to be squandered greatly. I can think of more greater things to do with the millions and billions of dollars that's already gone through the friends of you people here. And I want y'all to know today that this Omni Hotel does not need to be constructed. In other words, it needs to be I'm on my way hotel. I mean, go somewhere else and put it up. I have one more thing to say before I sit down now. I am a representative of the northeast side of Oklahoma City. This hotel money for these outside developers coming from out of town, it seems like every one of them who comes in, they get access to free money, but I don't get anything. And we're basically tired of that. We're not accept accepting it anymore. We're not tolerating it. And if we have to file lawsuits, I'm thinking about now in this hotel. Oh, I can, you know, delay it. I don't imagine I can stop it. But I'm just thinking real seriously. I said, now why should I let this Omni Hotel go up without an argument? Okay, just like other structures. I've been kind of turning my head on these things, but I ain't going to turn them no more. Okay, because like I said, no one has come to me and sat down and said, Mr. Washington, being a political activist, a community activist, what do you think about these ideas? I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about the developers. They should have come down and had coffee with me or something. Let me know you recognize this. One. Because right. other than that, it ain't going to work. Again, no funding for it. Thank you. Huh? All right, ready to vote on item 9D2. This is the ordinance that's been up for final hearing. Is there a motion? Yes. Cast your votes. And it passes 6 to 2. All right, we have a companion item on item 6E. All right, cast your votes. It passes 6 to 2. I, I actually did have a comment on that one, on 6E. Um, oh, 6 to 2E, I heard. The, uh, the, uh, <laughs> you know, the, I, I voted in favor of it at the uh, years ago whenever we we approved the quarter shore plan and but you know when we when we start each one of the districts, uh, for me I really have to evaluate each district as whether or not I feel like it needs the TIF and for for uh, for the district A. With all of the public improvement that we're already doing in that area, for me, I don't feel like it's needed. And especially with um, the fact that we were going to put the convention center there and we couldn't end up putting it there because the uh, cost of the land was so high, to me, it doesn't seem like I, I can legitimately say that most, at least most of the area of District A is um, dilapidated or uh, abandoned or in any of those sorts of uh, uh, words so um, which is which is why I ended up voting uh, no so I just wanted a little explanation on that okay item 6f is um, an assessment district uh, Northwest 178th Street this is in Ward 8 mark thank you your honor um, this ordinance is to be introduced and set for final hearing on uh, March 27th, which uh, is coming up. It's for Clifford Farms subdivision. Um, it's the assessment role uh, to uh, have the assessment for a water main that was created for the subdivision. I'd move for its approval, or I'd move for it to, that it be set for hearing. All right. We're voting on item 9F. This will set a final hearing for March 27th. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And item 9G would be the uh, sale of uh, geo bonds. Mayor, Kenny Siddle is going to talk to us a little bit about that this morning, and, and it's, it's 9G, H, I, and J are all related to a $123 million bond issue this year. If Kenny's coming up. You know, in my 14 years of working with, with Mayor Cornett, he's taught me a lot of things, but one thing he taught me from his media days is don't bury the lead. So, Kenny, did we get our ratings back from S&P? And yes, so the lead would be that we did have our AAA rating affirmed. Uh, by both Moody's and Standard & Poor's. So that's very good news. Uh, again, a reflection of how well the city's managed and your leadership and uh, really appreciate the conservative leadership that you all provide to us. Um, <clears throat> as uh, Jim said, we, we'll be doing $123.7 million worth of bonds this year. So this, this, this is going to be a combination that it, 
continues the 2007 vote. Um, it will and will be the first issuance from the 2017 vote that we just had a couple of months ago. About just a little bit under 50 million will be from the 2007, so that leaves us with about 44 million, <clears throat> excuse me, to issue on the 2007 uh, bond vote. Uh, the other 74 million will be projects from the 2017 authorization. So these items before you set the uh, sale date for two weeks from now on March 27th. It's a competitive bond sale and we'll be closing on May 10th and that's the date that we would have money uh, to begin work on the projects. Um, one other point I wanted to make, uh, due to some IRS considerations, this will be split into two bond sales. That's why you have four items. There's two items for each of the bond sales. Uh, 82.7 million will be done as tax exempt bonds. 40.9 million will be done as taxable bonds. So as we've always done in the past, we analyzed the, the bond with bond council, the types of uses and activities that are going on at these facilities with respect to the tax code. And so on the, on the bonds that we're doing as taxable, those are the projects for the Softball Hall of Fame, the Bricktown Ballpark and the Chesapeake uh, Energy Arena. And again, these, these are just things that have different types of activities going on there that are related to tourism and economic development that are typically done with taxable bonds. So that's a little bit of a nuance this year, but it's similar to what we've done in the past on some other things. So with that being said, we're kind of estimating, and I do want to give my caveat, I always give that this is an estimate and the market moves every day and we're doing this sale in a couple of weeks. But we're estimating we will be somewhere between about 3.1 and 3.3% on our tax exempt bonds and about 3.6 to 3.8% on the taxable bonds. So uh, with that, be happy to answer any questions. Kenny, is there any um, funding for the Civic Center uh, renos in this package as well? I don't believe that that project is in uh, this in set sale? of bonds, okay. yeah. Uh, I do. Uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, well, just a quick clarification of the 44 million remaining from the 2007, uh, are those specifically uh, designated for certain projects or how much of that is, is available for uh, non-specific projects? Do you so know? I'll have to get you that information. I can tell you that of the 44 million about 27.5 million is left in the streets proposition. I don't know exactly which projects those are. Uh -huh. uh, there's about 10 million left in parks, uh, 5 million left in bridges, about a million three left in traffic control, and a, and a very small amount, looks like about $5,000 left in drainage. So okay. uh, we can get some more information. No, that's fine. It sounds like it's all pretty well specifically uh, identified as to what that money will be used for. So I, I just had, a, I mean, I think it's amazing that we can sell $123 million in bonds. I remember a few years ago, it seemed like we could only sell like 40 million one year. So not that low. It goes up. And yeah, goes up we, and we had one year that was down uh, because of, some, <coughs> but generally we've been in the $100 million range lately. Yeah, when I, when I started doing this in 2007, I mean, we've been in the 60-ish, million range and as the property values in Oklahoma City have continued to grow and grow it gives us more capacity so we've been doing in the 90 million maybe that's all of it combined maybe it's just the 2007 bond we were only able to move like 40 million yeah we've had some years where we combine things from the 2000 <laughs> authorization and right. the 2007 and just we may like have just had just pieces. like we're doing here exactly we're selling 49 million or 50 million from 2007 and 74 million from 2017 I guess well, one frustration I have with the pr process is, um, you know, I came on the council seven years ago. I was, every year I've been hearing about kids walking in the middle of the street on Independence to get to Kirkland Elementary. And I'd tell them, well, you know, that was on the 2007 bond and it just, you have to sell a certain amount. And, you know, they've waited, they voted for that bond in 2007. Now they've waited 11 years and now we have a chance to sell $124 million of bonds, and they're still not going to get their 2007. That's one of the ones, David, my understanding is that will be delayed yet another year when we're, we're skipping over them to, to sell $74 million from the 2017 bond that the voters just passed a few months ago. So I guess 
a frustration of mine is that we have to do these like one mile square blocks, right? The contractors want to do a whole mile but there, what if there's something very important in one of those square miles, like kids walking in the middle? That, I think everybody in the residence in the area would, they'd wait for like the streets, but they just want the kids to be protected walking on independence. It's just a shame that we couldn't do that one street, but we have to delay it and delay it and delay it to do the whole square mile. And it's just, uh, I, I understand there's a good reason for all these things, like moving the helicopter from the Wheeler District and, um, you know, widening Sarah Road for $9 million. I think we have an obligation to ODOT or something. But it's just frustrating that $74 million from the one we just voted on a few months ago, while people are waiting, it'll be into their 12th year. Just to offer a couple of comments, I know that uh, when we, Public Works, assisted in putting together the project list, I think one of the things that we were very forward with the council is that we've always had intention to finish the bond sales this and next year. There are some key 2017 projects that the council has made commitments on, and that's really what's included in the list today are those that either ASA Hall of Fames or having sold the Wheeler district properties and needing to move the air support units and some other key projects. And so we were really working to find that proper balance as that has been presented to you. But to answer sidewalk questions, Councilman, we can absolutely, if there's an individual project and I could receive that information, we can expedite that probably outside of the bond program. Well, how about this, Eric? Sorry to interrupt. But could we, you know, we have the, the maps for streets or whatever, and we have those like that we're, we're using those dollars to expedite 2017 bond. If there's specific things like independence that, that's still not getting done on 2007, can we present that to the committee? I'll say that's absolutely possible. So when, uh, when Aubrey McDermott and I met with the sales tax committee just a couple of weeks ago, one of the things that we had announced to them was that the BIQAC OKC plan was going to be presented at their very next meeting, which is in just a few weeks. So the sidewalk, the trails, the bike lanes, and the streetscapes are still pending some recommendations from the advisory committee that are coming to the council, but we could absolutely include that as a part of the discussion. Okay. It just hasn't been discussed yet. Okay. They've only had two official meetings and a workshop, so um, we're working very quickly this spring to get projects implemented fast. Okay. So again, receiving anything about the independent sidewalking, you're correct, it's included in a larger bond resurfacing project. So to be more specific, in 07, you remember that the sidewalks weren't separate from the streets. They have to go with the streets. Right. In 17, it's very different. We have sidewalks separated from the streets. So we can do sidewalks independently, and we are working very closely with the sales tax initiatives and the MAPS program implementing sidewalks. But we're not ready to do the street. We could do the sidewalk early, and with your comments today, I'll be happy to expedite that. I appreciate it. I'd be grateful. Thank you. Okay. I'd move the resolution authorizing the sale. Second. All right. We're voting on item 9, G, H, I, and J, although we will take these individually. Cast your votes. Pass unanimously. Is there a motion on item 9, H? So moved. Second. All right. Cast your votes. Pass unanimously. Item 9, I. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And item 9J. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. All right. Item 9K is a public hearing regarding dilapidated structures. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 9K? Yeah. We'll go down here to 222. To Southeast 20th Street, AKA 224 Southeast 20th Street, Michael Washington. Give your name. Roland Betancourt. Good morning, Roland. Good morning. Yeah, um, I thought I had settled this a year ago when, when my house burnt, when I was living in it and it burnt, uh -huh. and I wanted to tear it down. And they said, well, if you turn in a list of plan of action that you're going to take upon the property, we'll dismiss it. So I turned in the paper and they dismissed it because I had taken down. That, that is actually the dining room there because it was a living room and bedroom and front porch. And I already removed all that dangerous stuff because it was just hanging there. That's the part that burnt. I already took that off and I started putting up siding and stuff. But I found out that I'd been walking around on a year with a broken leg and a broken steel plate that was in, in my hip. 
and I didn't know it. I had to go back and get it operated on and get another steel plate put in. Well, is, and, is this what it looks like today? Yeah. Oh, I mean, it, it I've needs started, some help. I've already started putting a siding. They don't, I was using it as my, as my dog's uh, dog house because it's that's not. That's, that's not thank you. There's no utilities. That's, that's enough. Thank you. Uh, Michael Watson, 2900 Northeast 18th Street. First of all, this man here, for the most part, I have basically adopted. And the reason why this property still is uh, terrible looking as it is, and again, I don't agree that it should continue to look like this here, is that the people who were actually selling it to him tried to take it from him. Well, we filed litigation in the court. We stopped all of that. And it had not been for that frivolous argument that those uh, property owners were actually trying to do, then this year clearly would have been uh, corrected. And what we're trying to do now is find him some money to help him out with it. As you can see, he's a poor uh, scrapper here, as if, uh, for lack of a better word. And certainly he should be given an opportunity in time to uh, make uh, preparations for uh, right. upgrading the properties. Michael, Charles, how long has the property been like this? Do we have any idea? Has it been a year? Yeah, it's, it's probably been over a year. Um, <clears throat> we started this back, in, uh, back last year, and uh, they gave us a plan of action. They were supposed to repair it. They did not do that. And, and during that time, the, uh, the owner has sold the property, uh, which is why the notice is, we resent a notice. This is a new go. owner. Uh, one of the reasons that she, she did sell is because he's incurred several liens on the property. Uh, the latest one's about $6,900. Um, and actually, he, he's in the middle of a, uh, of actually a uh, court case now, it's, you know, for a, 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 basically an eviction notice. It uh, was filed February 28th of 2017. All right. And again, are, I'm are part you of that. Are the owner? Sir, right. I, was, I was purchasing the property. Uh huh. The house caught fire in January 2017. Mm -hmm. I get a letter from the, the guy that I purchased it from. His wife sends me a letter saying that he died in November. She accepted three payments, makes the payments out to her from now on, and my deal with him was good <laughs> with her. I said, okay, let's send her a payment. And she, well, she come by and picked up a payment, and then she turns around. I, I, next day, I get an eviction on my door to get out. They take me to court to try to evict me. I'm like, so do, do they own the property or do you own the property? Pardon? Who, own, who owns the property? I was purchasing the property. I, I know, but who owns it today? Property, right? Yeah. Okay. So you have the title to this property? No, he doesn't. We're getting ready to go get that today. No. Like I said, I was buying it from Bill. He died. His wife said, make the payments in my name from now on. I said, okay. And then she turns around and sells it out from under me to somebody else. And then you're on it now. Oh, this is why I come in this on. way. Hold on. So if you're not the property owner, then I don't know that we have an issue to deal with, with you on this property. <laughs> now, again, first of all, like I said, I was here with this man from the beginning, and he's right. They did try to evict him, as this man talked about, but we stopped that in Judge Timmons' court. And whatever he talking about filed on February 28th or whatever day he talking about, that's, that's, that's going to be like wash, water down the drain too. Again, had they not been interfering with this man, he did have a contractual agreement which the court agreed upon to okay. buy the land from right. these people. He doesn't have a deed yet because he didn't know, but now that I'm in the picture, he's going to have a deed between nine and four the week is over with. But Michael, it's been like this for a year. Well, I didn't know that until I got into the Phil, picture. Uh, no one's blaming you. No one that I know of is asking for you to intervene. Well, he is. Where, <laughs> That's why I'm standing okay, here. Okay, go ahead. What I was told by cold enforcement is if I give him this list of things to do, so I did. And they said, okay, well, we're going to clear it off the books. We're not going to tear it down, right? And then now this lady pops up and says, oh, no, I'm going to work this. I noticed this, so I'm going to work this. Yeah, well, and, uh, I mean. W I said, oh, well, ma'am, it's already been cleared. I'm trying to work on it. She said, well, they made a, a mistake on the paperwork back then, so I'm going to rework it. It's not my fault they made a mistake on paperwork. I don't go to their office. I don't work in their office. I'd have done the paperwork right. <laughs> Charles? It actually, what was no mistake on the paperwork. The inspector died. Huh. And the property changed hands. So by statute, we had to start over. Bam. I, I, I guess. See. I guess the question is, as the, is the person, the owner, that the, the deed's in the name of, have they been given notice of this today? Yes. Okay. That's what I'm saying. We're the only one here, though. That's what I'm going to show because they know that if they okay. come, we're going to file a lawsuit right. on them for this frivolous well, action anyway. I'm going to suggest we leave the item on the list. All right. 
Is there anybody else here to speak to any other items uh, on the list? Just, you know, I'll talk to you later on. Yeah. Uh, All right. Is there a motion then on item 9K? All right. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 9L is a public hearing regarding unsecured yeah. structures. Wait on me. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 9L? Yes, um, Michael Washington, 2900 Northeast 18th Street. I see a couple of seven wards, uh, Ward 7's uh, um, properties. Like I said, that guy, we already know, I don't care about, uh, he's not here today, so evidently he wanted me to talk against him. Um, 10416 Eagle Lane, oh, excuse me, not, that's wrong, I'm sorry, 1408 East Euclid Street. That's the house. Okay, oh, okay. So the only been contacting, what, what are we trying to do with this here? Secure it. Oh, secure it. I was, uh, okay, that's no problem with that. So what does the owner have said that they, they try to secure it? Have they been able to reach him? Or? The owners have not contacted us back. Now, Ken, how long has that been that you contact? Uh, notice was posted last month. Oh, okay, so then you got a little bit of time to answer then? Yes. Okay. Um, 2304 Hood Avenue, House, Ward 7. And what, is this unsecured or what? Yes. How is it that I mean? Oh, okay, I see that. And have they been contacted? Yes. How long ago has that been? Last month. They, all these will be last month. Okay, then, so I won't have to ask that question anymore. Okay, uh, 1701 Northeast 19th Street, Ward 7 House. Oh, the window's broken? Oh, okay. That's what I'm okay, go ahead. I just want to look, since it's in my ward over there, I, I want to go by those places. 2233 Northeast 21st Street, detached garage. It's been stricken. They've been stricken. Okay, that's all of those then. Okay, I'm going to have a comment. I just wanted to look at them. All right, how about a motion then on 9L? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 9M is a public hearing regarding abandoned buildings. Is there anyone here hoping to speak or any item listed under 9M? Well, I was, but since we've already gotten that one issue, 22, 222 Southeast 20th Street, we, that was the only one I had a question with. Oh, be quiet, man. All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. All right, item 9N, understand we do not need executive session? Do not. How about a motion to uh, approve item 9N? Pass unanimously. All right, item 9O, understand we do not need executive session? Do not. All right, we have a motion and a second. We're voting on 9O, and it passes unanimously. Item 9P, understand we do need executive session? Yes. All right, how about a motion then to move 9P into executive session? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And item 9Q, understand we do need executive session? Yes. How about a motion there? Okay, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 9R is claims recommended for denial. Is there anyone here hoping to speak or any item listed under 9R? All right, is there a motion? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 10A is claims recommended for approval. Is there anyone here hoping to speak or any item listed under 10A? All right, how about a motion? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And item 11 is items from council. Uh, Ed, you want to start with your ordinance? <coughs> We've had some in, good in discussion, but, but really the issue on this ordinance is very, very narrow. Um, because state law is the same as Oklahoma City ordinance word for word, it would not, the law in Oklahoma City wouldn't change with repeal of this ordinance. The, the question, the very, very narrow question is, do we want our code enforcement to write tickets and then municipal counselor's office and judges be involved in the prosecution of, uh, of this issue, which is not, I mean, we, we refer it to, as the adult novelty store, but that really the language is a store, and this is, I'm not making it up, this is the actual language, a store that sells items which would stimulate the human genitalia. I think that's overly vague and difficult for our staff to try and, and work through. <coughs> and so this, this would just simply remove us from the process. The, the law in Oklahoma City is not going to change. State law is still the same. But but clearly there's a problem in 
in cities throughout Oklahoma, Edmond, Lawton, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, these, these stores are, are within the 1,000 feet in multiple cities, and I think this is a state issue that they need to provide direction. Um, and so we've asked that it go on our state committee. Uh, we ha and we have, we I guess, have right, right. But maybe this is something we can, we can bring up to the state. But for now, just remove ourselves from the, the prosecution process and, uh, and rescind the ordinance. Okay. We have three people that have signed okay. up to speak. Uh, Jennifer Scott. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Good morning. Um, Jeff, I will need your name and address. 1509 for the Southwest 44th, 73129. Okay. Um, I prepared a statement. I'm not a really good public speaker, so. Uh, as a lifelong Oklahoma resident, parent, and having a degree in religious studies, I have always had a desire to help people. As we all know, it is our Oklahoma way. When I decided to change careers and leave corporate America and do something completely different, I decided to take employment with Adam and Eve in Oklahoma City. I had no idea what I was in store for this. I work with the most amazing individuals. Also the owners, Andrew and Lennox, care more about what they are doing than any other place I've ever been employed in the state. They have a passion for what they do. We are not just a novelty store, as some might think. We are required as employees to take educational classes. I have personally witnessed individuals and couples come in, purchase our products, and come back a few days later thanking us for changing their lives, including saving a marriage. We give education to everyone that comes through our doors. Again, we are not just a novelty store. We are very diligent about making sure anyone under the age of 18 is not allowed in the store. This has included my own son and his friends who have tried to come in, and I've had to turn them away and answer their questions outside of that arena. We provide a service, a need that many individuals and couples have in this day and age of the internet. Many times we have dispelled myths and ideas that they had which were wrong, and we educated them correctly. I strongly urge you to reconsider this ordinance and allow us to continue to do what we do, which is to educate the public in a unique setting. Thank you. Good afternoon. Andrew Ryerson Gonzalez, 2905 Northwest 70th Street. And um, we've now all been before you several times. And again, I want to thank you, Your Honor, and all the council members for considering this um, on the merits that we presented. And uh, rather than go over these details again, because I know your time is valuable, I just want to make myself available to answer uh, any additional questions any of you might have uh, before uh, considering this vote today to repeal if there is any that otherwise I will give my time to Lennox. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Lennox Ryerson Gonzalez, 2905 Northwest 70th Street. Um, I'm just going to echo what Andrew just said. Um, I don't know what else we can offer um, to influence any type of resistance in, in this uh, outdated um, criminal ordinance. Um, what we're trying to do here is very positive for the community. I don't expect everybody to understand it. We're just trying to make an honest living here and help the community. We're bringing sex educators, couples counselors, and anything to help couples stay together. Like Jennifer said, we're not just an adult novelty store. I would invite you guys to come in, but that just seems ridiculous for somebody who might be against something like that. But if you were to come into our store, like many of the people that walk in through our store, 
within the first two minutes you would see what we're doing and you would absolutely not even continue thinking on the path that you're thinking that we are just like the rest of the establishments like that. We're not. We're not. So I don't know what else I can say. I can answer any questions that anybody might have, but this has um, been a um, really <laughs> trying time for us to get through this. So I appreciate the time again to be allowed to speak. So that's all I have to say. All right. Thanks, Lance. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right, Ed. Is there a second? The motion is to repeal. Yes. Okay. All right. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Motion fails two to five. All right. Mark, we have other comments from council? Nothing today, Your Honor. All right. Other Meg. than I enjoyed the article in the uh, Gazette and your picture on the cover. Oh, thank you. Meg? All right. David? <clears throat> yes, Your Honor. It's really a question as to whether or not we can even consider doing something like this. So sometimes uh, we are presented with proposed zoning changes, and it's specific for a development. And then for one reason or another, a development changes their minds or defers this project. And so I guess I'm asking Kenny, Kenny, can we have a rule that says, okay, we'll agree to a change in zoning for this area, let's say from AA to commercial or residential development, but you've got basically three years, four years, five years to do this proposed development, and if not, then the zoning reverts back to its previous uh, designation. Can we do something like that? Let us do, Let us do some research on that. Uh, it's, that it, question's come up previously. Uh, Dan may have written an, a legal opinion on that, but I, I've forgotten exactly what it says. I, I think I've read something on that before where I, I know in, in my ward I had some PUDs that came into existence in the late 70s and early 80s, uh -huh. and we wanted to revisit them, and I know there was some uh, I, I think that there is already a memo or something on that. Yes, uh, if if you can do that, you would have to do that to be able to revisit it. Essentially, you can't just uh, zone something and then come back and down zone it. And actually, once you've approved a particular zoning, the council has made a a decision that that's appropriate for that location. So sure. someone. Even if, even if you can terminate it out like a sunset or something like that, if they came back in, you'd have to rezone it to that again because you've already done it once. But unless conditions change, you know, if it was a long period of time or something, but let, let, let me uh, look at that again. Right. And I've not really thought that through. It's, it's, when I was talking on a, uh, another matter, it just began to uh, surface that there are instances that, even in Ward 5, where we have approved something four or five years ago with the anticipation at the time we approved it that, you know, they were ready to begin with that development. Here it is four or five years later, nothing's developed. And so, again, I don't know if it's a good idea. I just want to raise the question and let the council talk about the positives and negatives for something like that. Sure. If it's something we could revisit, I would like to take a look at it. Okay. Thank you. Yes, it's come up in the past, and actually I think it's been raised by Ward 5 before, so. Oh, well, yeah. it's good to know I'm carrying on that. You are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Todd? Larry? Ed? Yeah, I mean, I, I think they deserve, I, I'd like some clarification. These, these people, these business owners have come down here multiple times. If five people vote against it today, I, I, for, first question I'd ask is for clarification. So, so what we're saying now is that if, if somebody makes a complaint, we're going to enforce this ordinance. If somebody doesn't make a complaint, we're not going to enforce the ordinance. So my first question would be, who is able to make that complaint? Is it somebody within 300 feet of the establishment or any citizen of Oklahoma City? Any citizen of Oklahoma City. So any citizen of Oklahoma City can make a complaint, including somebody from a competing business, could make a complaint against, so, so they could make a complaint against every other 
establishment in Oklahoma City which is selling merchandise which they would deem as stimulating human genitalia and then, and then they would ask that for our staff make a determination whether that store is selling merchandise which would stimulate gen human genitalia and m then make a decision as to who to cite and who not to cite. Is that, that's how we're, we're going forward? That's how we always go forward. Okay. Well, and I think one thing too, the ordinance looks at the type of entity and so it would be dependent upon what type of entity it is. So let's say like a lingerie store, would that, would that qualify? I'm gonna let Kenny give the legal opinions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kenny, would a lingerie store qualify? I'll take the tough questions. No, I don't think a just a lingerie store. Right. I doubt it. It's, and note, note the wording is, it would be devices, instruments, or paraphernalia designed or marketed primarily for the use that we're discussing. Not, it's not that the device would be primarily for that use. So it's going to have to be, it's really a question of fact. The in inspectors go out and look at it <laughs> and determine. I, it's just so sad that we put our staff through that. But they okay, go out. Go they go out and make an inspection right. and determine whether or not they think there's probable cause that, that this is a violation of the ordinance. Then it goes to the judge, and that would be it would go to the judge either if it were in municipal court or if we brought an injunction to close them down in district court, and then the judge would determine whether or not it's a violation. And so the same would apply to like Spencer's and Penn Square Mall or all the Christie's Toy Box or all the other, any store that's, that's selling merchandise that would qualify under language that you just described. Again, I think it depends on the entity under the ordinance and, its lo and the entity's location. Yep. Well, and, and, and clearly, I mean, there are places within Oklahoma City that a store like this can locate. This just, it's limited. Right. Because Correct. there are store there are adult novelty stores in existence within the Oklahoma City boundaries. Right, but what about like a Spencer's and Penn Square Mall with that? I believe that there's only two of those and I'd be very surprised if they were within a, th a thousand feet of any of these uses. But certainly anybody can turn in a complaint if they want to against any store and the inspectors will go out and in inspect. So that, so that's, so the city of Oklahoma City policy that we're establishing here is that if nobody complains, we will not cite on our ordinances. But if anybody complains within, that's an Oklahoma City citizen, then we will enforce the ordinance. That's we're Oklahoma not establishing city. that policy here. That's been a long-standing policy that we enforce zoning cases primarily upon complaint. Primarily or exclusively. Well, I would say, I, I, I just don't think we want to set bad precedent because they built a building within 1,000 feet. Uh, I served on the Board of Adjustment and we looked at variances all the time. And if we start correcting every time somebody makes a mistake, uh, you have to meet certain statutory grounds uh, to get a variance. And uh, we just don't want to head down, number one, it's a bad precedent, and number two, I believe it sends, it sends the wrong message. Well, they didn't build a building. They they entered into a lease and they leased it, bought it, whatever. Right. What what they, message? What bad message are we sending? I'm just asking for clarification for them as well, to the to the public. Are we? Is it the rescinding of this that we're somehow endorsing? I, I don't think it, it, from a bad precedent standpoint. I just don't think that every time somebody makes a mistake as to where they build something, where they lease something, where they buy something, and, and, and it conflicts with an ordinance. We can't just go repeal ordinances uh, to correct the problem. Uh, we have to enforce those ordinances. We don't always enforce the ordinances 24-7 because we don't have the person power to do that. Uh, we enforce those ordinances when we're called upon to do it, just like speeding. We don't enforce speeding, all speeding signs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We do it where we can and when we can with the staff that we have available. But we have, we have existing businesses that are also out of compliance. I, so, don't, I, so don't, I don't know that to be the case, and, and I think we ought to take that up if, at the appropriate time if something comes up. But we, we've had three hearings on it. I mean, you've had testimony. You've had Christie's Toy Boxes a half we, mile we, down the street. We, we just had one building that 
we were looking at. We weren't looking at the overall policy in my mind. I'm, this is my ward. I'm telling you a mile down the street, there's the exact same business that's within right next to houses. It's the exact same business. I mean, it's not that somebody made a mistake. It's that we have an inherently discriminatory policy that we discriminate against some businesses. We enforce against some businesses, but not others. Strict, exclusively based on if somebody calls in or not. And if nobody calls in, then we just let the ordinance slide. We, we, we just differ on that point. All right. Yeah, I, I would disagree with that. We enforce the ordinance on our complaint basis. We don't have, a, we don't have a, enough personnel to send them out to canvas the city at all times for violations of all ordinances. Okay, but right now I'm telling you, right, we've had three hearings on it, that right down the street is another business. So if you're going to write a citation against them, are you going to write a, bus a citation against, it only takes a few minutes to, to drive down the street and write to the a citation against the other business. If you turn in a complaint with an address, the inspectors will go out and look at it and, and but, write a citation. But only if somebody puts in a complaint. That's the way we enforce all the land use ordinances and, and other ordinances for that matter. And, and I just, okay, and we can disagree. I feel that's inherently discriminatory, that it's only and exclusively if somebody calls in or not. Uh, but you you an, another remedy they would have for the ordinance and have had all along is to go to the Board of Adjustment and ask for a variance. So they can ask for a variance to the ordinance. They're, they would either get it or not get it and then can go to district court on the variance. Uh, the issue they would have, however, is even if they get the variance from the Board of Adjustment or District Court, it's still going to violate the statute. The state law. The state law. Right, which I understand that. But they can go to the Board of Adjustment and ask for a variance. There are several remedies available to them. What, what else besides and, that? And I want to clarify, that's my thinking too. They have a lot of remedies that they haven't pursued yet. And at the end of the day, there's a state statute that exactly mirrors what we have here. So, so we're, we're, making, we're doing something to no effect when the opportunity is presented here for the business owner okay, to try well, to correct asking, their own mistakes. We, so. They're coming and asking for, so I just want, I don't want five people to vote against it and not say anything. Tell, tell them what their remedies are. What, so Board of Adjustment, what else? You said there's several. District Court. District Court, so they can file, so they appeal right. when they get a, a they, ticket they the can municipal. Move, they can move the business to a location that's not within a thousand feet. Just violate their uh, lease and, and, and leave? Well, Break their or lease try to work out something with their landlord because they're in, they're in a non-legal location and that wasn't disclosed to them. I mean, I, I don't know what was disclosed to them. I don't know any of the details, but they could relocate the business into a legal conforming area. They should apply for a variance to the ordinance. That, that's the first thing they should do and okay. pursue that because that will end up in district court. Now they'll still have the issue after, even if they win that somewhere, they're still gonna be in violation of the state law and if someone comes down to the council and says, we would like you to file an injunction against this business because they're in violation of the state law, the city could potentially do that. So as Meg said, the only effect you're gonna have is it won't be in municipal court. Right, that was right. the purpose of, right. Mm -hmm. but, but right now, what they should do is apply for a variance. Okay, all right. James? All right, items from the city manager. We have a presentation today on council priority briefing regarding promote safe, secure, and thriving neighborhoods. And Doug Dollar is here this morning to kick it off. Good morning, Mayor and Council. In the fall of 2016, Council adopted a set of seven top priorities for the next two to five years, as well as progress indicators to measure how we as a city are doing in those areas. And so today we have several department directors who will be presenting information on their areas as it relates to the council priority to promote safe, secure, and thriving neighborhoods. So the priority is adopted by council reads, neighborhoods are the building blocks of a great city and residents expect safe neighborhoods that provide a high quality of life. We will continue to promote strong and safe neighborhoods by providing public safety services, effective code enforcement, and support for neighborhood revitalization efforts. We will work with our partners to support education initiatives that encourage strong neighborhood schools. And so the indicators that were adopted alongside that priority are shown here on this slide. And I'm just gonna to touch on briefly the data for EMSA uh, response times, which you can see here, have been very consistent over the last number of years, staying right around 88, 89 percent. 
IMSA has a response time standard for priority one calls to arrive within 10 minutes and 59 seconds. In the contract with AMR, their service provider, IMSA requires the contractor to arrive within the standard 90% of the time. However, they do provide some exceptions during rainy or bad weather and other specific circumstances. We have, what we include in our LFR measure for IMSA does not include any of those exclusions. So we want to show what residents are actually receiving over the course of the year without making exceptions of any kind. So again, we're seeing about 88% through the first half of the year, uh, which covered over 11,000 uh, responses that uh, IMSA made. So next we have uh, Chief City, who's going to be talking about uh, police and uh, their efforts uh, regarding safe and secure neighborhoods. I will be presenting for the police department some of the priority indicators that uh, relate to police. Go to the next slide. Uh, and we start with the crime rates. We'll go through a couple of the crime rates. Uh, historical perspective from 2004 to 2017. Uh, you can see our homicides. You know, we had a high on this chart you can see in 2012 uh, of 85 homicides. In 2017, and these are actual numbers, uh, this is, uh, we usually get the FBI statistics in October for the previous year, but since we, we keep count of all of our homicides, we're able to provide that. So this is an actual count of 81, so it was, it was pretty high this year. Went up, you can see, about 11 homicides. Things that are excluded from that are officer involved, related homicides, justifiable homicide by a citizen or something like that. Those are not counted in these statistics. The next category is, is going to be rapes. Uh, you can see there's been a steady increase since 2011. Some of that's going to have to do, and I, I've stated it before, is going to have to do with a uh, defining rapes a little bit differently by the federal government. The definitions change to include, uh, include other categories. Uh, but you can see here there's been an increase. Since 2004 and 2017, there's been an increase of about 100. Uh, but there's been since 2011 at our lowest peak there's an increase of 197 again a lot of that is going to be because of that the other part of that is just there's more awareness there's a lot more discussion there's a lot more you know we, we adopt we adopt a uh, a policy among our officers is that is that if somebody reports it it's real and we we make sure that we report that we're more receptive to our victims and treat our victims, try to treat our victims a lot better uh, than we used to. So you're going to see a lot of a lot of reporting that goes up as a result of that, also. So it's hard to tell exactly the number of increases in rapes or the number of reported because we always knew it was underreported. In robberies, you can see in in robberies uh, we had a peak in 2008. Our robberies have steadily gone down. 2017. We had, you know, what, about 24 less robberies from, from 2016. Uh, and it's, it's, it's pretty much been on decline since 2011. Next slide is going to show aggravated assaults. Uh, you'd think a lot of times there's a correlation between aggravated assaults and homicides. Uh, aggravated assaults, which are our serious assaults, don't seem to fluctuate as much as homicides do. Homicides, you could have a high year or a low year. Homicides are merely an assault with the worst possible outcome, and that's the death of the individual. So this is really much more of an indicator of, of the amount of serious uh, crimes against person or assaults, and I think is a better indicator than homicides actually are, because it will ebb and flow much more than this has. And you can, you can see since 2012, we've actually gone down, but since 2015, We've started to inch back up on our in our serious assaults since then. Uh, you can see what we what we did since uh, 2012 to 2015. We actually had a 20 percent decrease in aggravated assaults, but since 2005 and 17, the last couple of years, it's inched up to uh, plus 11 percent. So uh, it's starting to rise a little bit. That is a national trend. Uh, uh, the increase in aggravated assaults is actually inching up, up nationwide. That doesn't mean it's acceptable, and that's what we want to do, but we are having uh, an increase in those, those types of crimes. Uh, you can see here when providing a safe neighborhood in our LFR by 2019, and we use a base from 2017. Uh, our actual was 3,429 
aggravated assaults. And our goal is to reduce that every year by 5 percent since 2017. Uh, you know, we've, we, we've reduced it probably by about 1 percent. We actually had, in 2016-17, we had a 1.8 percent increase. Uh, but there are some initiatives that we were doing uh, with overtime and things like that. With the addition of the officers, the city managers authorized additional overtime to address some of these areas. And I think if, 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 you, look at, if you look at the chart before, you can see that most of the decrease in aggravated assaults occurred during the time we had overtime initiatives where we put more officers in concentrated areas of violent crime. So I think that uh, I'm hoping that with, with those initiatives, once again, and we're getting ready to start those back up uh, with some salary savings, that we'll be able to reduce, reduce that and address that a little bit more. Uh, violent crime, uh, our clearance rates, if you, if you look at 2016 OCPD compared to the national average, and again, the, the national average is based on the FBI statistics that comes out every fall. In 16, you can see we had a 68% compared to 59% for homicides in our clearance rate, aggravated assaults, 57, 57 to 53, and so on for rape and robbery. We're, we're always higher. We're pretty close in robbery uh, on our clearance rates, and that's pretty consistent even with our actual clearances in 2017. You can see in 2017 with homicides, we're actually 10 percent higher, a higher clearance rate than we actually had last year, and we're way above the national average. Aggravated assaults, you know, around 3 percent. Rapes, we actually have a 51 percent in 2017, which is an increase from 16 and a significant, significantly higher than, a, than the national average in 2016. Chief, um, there's a lot of talk about uh, big backlogs in untested rate kits. Yes. Is, does that apply at the city level? Well, it's, 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 it's a little more complicated. I mean, it all started with, with uh, the city of Detroit, and they actually had a backlog. These are, these are kits that were untested, actually kits that should be tested. The kits that we have, and we, we, have, we have an accurate count of all of our kits, and we can tell you exactly why they're not tested. Uh, the discussion, and I'm sitting on the task force, and the discussion on the task force is, should all kits be tested? Well, those, those kits cost about $800 a piece to test. And then we have other crimes, homicides, other crimes that we also need to test for DNA. The question is going to be whether or not those kits should be tested. And that's some of the discussions we're having on the task force. Because if, if a victim declines to prosecute, or the DA declines to prosecute, or if the individual knows the donor, uh, of the suspect and knows who the suspect is, sometimes those kits don't need to be tested. We know who the donor is. The case is not going to be prosecuted because the victim has declined to prosecute or is not cooperative. Uh, I think a better solution, and, and probably of that, because we really feel like the kits that we currently have that are untested are kits that, that did not need to be tested because, because either the DA declined, the victim declined, and we can tell you every, everyone that did that. The argument. The argument is, is should you test all of them? My position at this point is probably it's not because it's because it's it's really it's very costly. And the important thing I think is that we keep those kits. Right now we're keeping every kit. So if a victim were to be victimized today and doesn't want to prosecute, but ten years from now decides, you know, I had a lot of things going on. I was intimidated. I was scared. I want to prosecute. We would still have that evidence. Well, it seems to me another argument might be it does get it into a database so that if that um, person that can, committed that crime, right. even if it wasn't prosecuted by one person, it might be prosecuted by another and the data would be there. So there probably and that's, is. And, there's, and there's, that's another part of the discussion in the task force where right. it goes into the CODIS system, which is a national system that keeps all DNA. Right. Now, one of the concerns I have that would have to be worked through is that you would essentially possibly be putting an innocent person into that database uh, if it's not prosecuted or if it was if the person at that time didn't want to continue with that for whatever reason and then you have to honor the victim if they don't want to prosecute then if you automatically put that evidence into that database you're potentially putting an innocent person into a national database for DNA uh, on a possible rape, and I'm not sure that I would agree with that. Okay. 
it's, it's pretty complicated. And those are some of the things the task force is having to address. And we've done a real good job of, of we started a year ago uh, count, counting that because we, we saw it be, becoming an issue. So we were way ahead of that. Uh, so we were able to get all of our data into the task force in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see here the percent of citizens. This is based on the surveys. Uh, from 2012 to 2017, our baseline was 55 back in uh, 2005 when all this started. But you can see where we've, we've slowly declined a little bit as far as citizens who report they feel safe. Uh, you know, we started with 53 in 2012. We're down to 48 at this point. We had a high of 58, and we have 48 the last two years. Do you expect to see that bump up with the addition of the new officers that have been fighting? Yeah, I, I think you definitely. I mean, it, a lot of it has to do with police presence. A lot of it, some of it has to do with, uh, you know, what's going on nationally, the amount of attention and issues that are going on nationally with law enforcement. It's a totally different environment in this day and time than I have ever seen it. Uh, you know, and so uh, law enforcement has a lot to overcome. Because uh, if somebody, another city, or there's, there's issues in other cities where that, that trust is in question and police are in question, it affects us. It affects us. And with social media, it becomes even more of an issue because it spreads like wildfire. And uh, so it's, it, it's a challenge. Uh, and some of that has to do with the media, and some of it has to do with just the presence of officers in the field. Uh, part of our job is that presence to make uh, help people feel safe, and they feel safe if they see officers out there in their neighborhoods and those types of things. So, and, and that's, that's what that number indicates in many cases. Our response times, you know, this year, we changed it to 80%. We used to have it at 90% after the staffing study, but you can, with that, we knew that we, wasn't, we weren't gonna be able to reach that. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't really based on any <coughs> data. So it's, we, we lowered it to 80 and 16. We actually went up 2% uh, for our fiscal year 18 through, Jan through the January, which is about half the fiscal year. Uh, we're up 2% as far as our response times, which is pretty encouraging. Any other questions? Thank you. <clears throat> All right, citizens to be heard. Oh, I'm sorry, Chief. Come on up. Do I need to state my address? <laughs> I think we know how to find you. <laughs> yes, sir. Good morning, Mayor, Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to talk about our involvement in assuring our residents live in a safe and secure community with thriving neighborhoods. We have several key LFR measures that address response time, and today I would like to update you on our measures and our strategic results. As you can see here, our key measures in operational services and dispatch, we're looking at four of them, and that's our fire incidents dispatch within one minute, 90% of the time, our MS and PD incidents dispatch within two minutes, 90% of the time, our fire responses within five minutes, 70% of the time, and our EMS responses within five minutes, 70% of the time. This slide right here shows you from uh, 2010 to 2018, and I will, uh, if you see the asterisk there on 2018, that is, uh, we have numbers up to uh, December of 2017. That's our estimate for 2018. If you look at that, you see a decrease. Uh, we've seen a steady incline until 2012, and then we've seen that decrease that started in 2013. I want you to take note of that, and that's when we started our CAD to CAD implementation, and we actually started also our medical priority dispatching. And that's where the CAD to CAD, we could actually see a lot more data. We've seen the data that came across what IMSA had, and we could share that data, and it helped us out in determining our responses. The medical priority dispatching is where we looked at those lower priority or lower acuity calls where we didn't respond. Now we only respond to the higher priority life-threatening calls, and that's the reason you've seen that decrease. I also want you to take note, and you see the three different colors there, the blue being EMS, the red being other incidents, and the uh, green being our fire responses, kind of talk a little bit about each one of them. Uh, our blue, which is our EMS, is about 70% of our call volume. So that stayed pretty steady over the time. 25% uh, is our others, and others include agency assist, and that's where we actually respond with maybe IMSA, but we show up and they're already there. We're just helping them out. 
So that may uh, fall into that cat that would fall into that category. Also, our automatic alarms, down power lines, elevator type calls, anything outside of the the fire or EMS would be in another. And then our fire calls, which is about 3.68 percent, and that actually is our structural fires, wildland urban interface fires, automobile fires, trash fires, uh, as such. So again. We looked at that. November 2013 is when we implemented that medical priority dispatching. You've seen that decrease in that call volume. This here is our line graph that actually shows fire and EMS uh, and our response times as far as our dispatch, getting that call dispatched. And you'll see there's two different graphs. And the reason they're different, I want to talk a little bit about why they're different. The fire is one minute, and that is because when they call 911 and they ask for police fire ambulance, it goes directly to fire if it's a fire. So we have one minute in that area. The reason we have the two minutes in the IMSA or PD, if they call and request an ambulance, IMSA actually goes through that protocol that I was talking about in that medical priority dispatching, and there's a trigger point. If that determines it's a higher priority life-threatening call, then it's transferred to us and we respond on it. So there is a little bit more of a delay in that area. So I think it's important you understand why the difference between the one minute and two minute. Also want to take note, if you'll see the slight decrease when we started our CAD to CAD in, in uh, 2012, which is actually shown there in that quarter one of 2013. The reason for that is we had some changes in our procedures. So that actually, uh, uh, we had some issues there and there's some technology issues that we have addressed and you've since seen that uh, line start to move up. In November of 2013, as we started the medical priority dispatching, the line started to improve. And then you'll see where you see the marked increase there on the red line was FY 2015. And that's when we actually started using data to look at our dispatchers and making sure that they were getting that within the appropriate one minute time frame. And when we was able to show them where they fall within that area, we seen a real marked increase in that. And that's where you see that sharp increase in that red line. This here is our response time within five minutes. This represents the time a company is dispatched until they actually arrive on the scene. Uh, although we've seen, and I'll talk about our seven minute measure here in a second, although we've seen improvements in the seven minute measure, this measure here has stayed pretty steady at about 59%. Um, we are looking at and working with a new vendor that's in the implementation phase to help us take our data that we have in our record management system to really try to drill down and see why are we not meeting those measures. Is there certain things that we can address and try to improve this uh, response? So we're really looking at that. I, I do want to take note and uh, think it's important we talk about last year we did our in uh, insurance services organization audit and that's where they come through usually every four years and they look at the fire department as far as fire response. And in that, they actually have two different areas they evaluate your response. They can look at it by deployment model, and that's where your stations are located. Or they can actually take your data and look at your fire response. Last year, they were actually able to use our fire response data. So it was, it, that helped us in a lot of different areas. And if you recall, we are a ISO class one fire department, which is the highest rate you can achieve. So that is good to note that we were able to achieve that looking at our response times. This is one of the strategic, a couple of strategic results that we have that we're going to talk about, and that's all fire responses within seven minutes, 70% of the time. And this is actually when we receive the call, we pick up till we arrive on scene. This is looking at the total measure. Here's some examples of that, uh, kind of looking at, uh, I'll drill down a little bit more in the next couple of slides, but you can see real quick in a snapshot of where we're at. In, in 2015, we're at 59%, and that was our total seven minutes. We did increase that in the next three years. You can see 16, 17, and where we're at year to date in 18, we're at 65%. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we've been able to improve those measures and increase that. This is our seven minute response time, and you can see the graph. I know there's a lot of movement in that. Um, in that seven minutes, 70% of the time. But prior to 2015, we still, in this one also stayed really on the average about 59%. But we took uh, and looked at our controlled measures, areas we could, we could actually affect change, and we started looking at those. And two of those we looked at was our turnout time, and that's the time our firefighters get the alarm till they get out of the station. And we wanted to really address that and making sure we were meeting that turnout time. So we started addressing that and that helped us. And we also, as I talked about earlier, we started looking at our dispatchers and started showing them where they were meeting their one minute uh, 
time. And those were areas we were actually able to see an increase. And I'm going to show you how we uh, dealt with that on a couple slides after this. This is our out-of-shoot times. This is where I was talking about earlier, when we receive the alarm till we get out of the station. Our goal for that is we want to be out of the station 90% of the time in one minute or less. So it's important that our firefighters get out of the station in a quick and timely manner so we can provide that response. So when we started looking at this, you can see in, in 2014, we were about 55%. And that was pulling the data out of our records management systems to see how quick we are looking at. And when we started talking to our personnel, the perception was they were doing a better job than that. But when we really used the data and drilled down, we realized that we could improve. So we started doing that and we started showing that to our officers. And each month we show them the reports of each individual apparatus on every shift. And as you can see from that, uh, from there until where we're at today, we're almost at 90%. So just seeing that data has really helped us a lot. And that's what's helped us improve from that 59% to 65% in that seven minutes or less. We believe that's an area that's really helped us in that. I think it's important we talk about when we look at a safe and secure community, community that we look at our structure fire fatality. So I'm going to talk about some strategic results here. Our, we're going to look at our structure fire fatalities per 100,000 residents. This, uh, there's some areas in this that also affects our response time. The number of fire department non-emergency public safety activities, the number of smoke alarms distributed to citizens, and the percentage of elementary schools in Oklahoma City limits receiving second grade fire safety presentations. So in order to provide early detection, notification, public safety education on the use of 911 smoke alarm installation and education and how to create effective safety plans, it can make a difference in our response times. Our, our non-emergency non contacts that I talked about, our goal was 50,000 contacts and that's where we're out actually putting up smoke alarms, teaching people how to utilize 911 and our kids and making sure the next generation are, are aware of fire safety and, and very um, uh, know what to do with that and we're also teach them how to do exit drills in the home and that's important for us in our response time early notification really makes a difference in our response time and the other part of that is the schools we're in hundred percent of all Oklahoma City schools within the Oklahoma City limits every year with second graders and it's very important that we get out we teach them about fire safety and that in turn there's a multiplier effect to that because they go home and get mom and dad involved and that's very important for us in making sure that we have a safe and secure community this one here is one that we've really tried to address. I know everyone's aware that we had a tough January this year. Uh, our, our goal that we look at is uh, standard is 1.03 fire fatalities per 100,000 residents. Right now we're at 2.45. Uh, again, just in the month of January, we had 13 fire fatalities. You can see historically from 2004 where we're at today. So we wanted to make sure that we could address these. And when we started looking at them, they all had one common theme, and that was no working smoke alarms that we could account in the residents. So we really wanted to address that. This right here is a graph talking about our smoke alarms installed and what we tried to do to uh, secure, make sure we have a safe and secure city. We averaged in the last two years about 300 smoke alarm installations a month, and that's free smoke alarms up to code in residential structures. Just in the month of January and February, we was able to install 1,929. So you can see that marked increase. So we really worked hard at that. This was a collaborative effort. We worked with Red Cross. We worked with our Metro Fire Explorer program. And we actually did canvassing in areas that were, you know, where we seen were high risk areas. We hit, uh, the area we hit three times was Western to Penn, Reno to Northwest 10th. And we're looking at other areas, but we, we canvassed that entire, entire mile section. We also are working with the Capitol Hill Civic Group and Red Cross on a date to be determined to try to work in their areas. And then uh, May 4th, we're working with Red Cross and they have what they call, a, it's their national program, Sound the Alarm. And it's gonna be around Northwest 23rd in May in the Taft Stadium area. So we're really gonna focus on that and continue to do that throughout the year. I think. We really believe the collaborative efforts has made a huge difference and we're gonna continue that. We're also happy to note that we put a, a dedicated phone line in for smoke alarms where people can call 316 BEEP and that's calls direct. It's a positive contact. We'll install a smoke alarm that day, no later than 24 hours. We also put that in English and Spanish. So we're trying to meet the needs of our community. We've also put it online in, in English and Spanish so they can go online and request a free smoke alarm. So we really want to try to make this as simple as we can, an easy contact so we make sure we address that. So we're really excited about those efforts. We, we just recognize that public safety is the key to making sure that we have a safe and secure community 
and that we uh, affect our response times by that early notification. So do we have any questions? Again, thank you for your support of public safety. I appreciate it. Next is Aubrey McDermott. Good morning again. Um, I wanted to report on the planning department's uh, Thriving Neighborhoods Council Priority. And part of our council priority statement says that we will work to support neighborhood revitalization efforts. That's one of the primary functions of the planning department. So the progress indicator to measure this is the percent of residents who are satisfied with the overall quality of their neighborhood. And back in 2014, with our citizen survey, we broke the citizen survey question down to get into more information specifically about safety, appearance within their neighborhood, property maintenance issues, sense of community, amenities, and overall quality. This helps us really target our efforts towards making improvements in these categories. Um, our citizen survey response rates have been pretty consistent in the past four years that we've been measuring this with an overall average quality of 66, 67 percent. Um, back in 2016, the citizen survey saw a dip in satisfaction pretty much throughout the entire survey. That was kind of a theme that was also true with, with these questions, but overall the averages have remained pretty healthy. But I wanted to talk about what happened in 2013. When we were preparing for the development of our comprehensive plan, we had several studies that we had commissioned, and the Housing Market Preference and Demand Study of 2013 came up with some really interesting key findings. These key findings were things that we really started to develop um, strategies and recommendations in our comprehensive plan about where people want to live, why they choose to live where they want to live, and how they feel about Oklahoma City as a home. One of the key findings was that nearly 80% of the households in Oklahoma City place a greater importance on neighborhood characteristics rather than the building characteristics. And those neighborhood characteristics you might recognize because those are the ones that we added into our citizen survey in 2014 to start measuring how people felt about the quality of their neighborhood, the sense of place, perceptions of safety and security, access to parks and other amenities, and the proximity of their neighborhoods to places that they'd like to go. And of all of those, the sense of safety and security was the most important factor for everything, which I think you've seen reported on by the previous directors how hard the city is working to make sure that people do feel safe and secure. The housing market and, uh, preference survey also made several recommendations. I wanted to update you about progress on those. Uh, several of these recommendations were woven into our comprehensive plan and multiple city departments and many of our partners worked to try to implement these ideas. Both, uh, the first one was to prioritize projects, programs, and regulations that affect safety and security, which you just saw two presentations about some of the efforts of police and fire to do that. Also working closely with the school districts, and it was kind of great that uh, there was an item on our agenda today that the city is working to help the school district make sure that their facilities are safe. Also to fund placemaking strategies in key locations and prioritize working in areas of transformation. Areas of transformation were identified in that study but you might be familiar with the city's Strong Neighborhoods Initiative, which helps to implement these ideas through those programs. The planning department also has been working on area plans in the Windsor District and West 10th District that do highlight walkability and connectivity. From those area planning efforts, we were able to identify corridors for specific improvements for sidewalks, bicycle infrastructure, and street enhancements that made it onto the 2017 general obligation bond list. And point number six is to invest in sidewalks, bike lanes, trails, and transit. And I think that you all do realize that the 2017 bond does make significant investments towards those goals. Plus, we have our sales tax um, extension, so we are able to put additional resources into sidewalks, bike lanes, and trails through that. And point seven and eight, remove regulatory barriers to preserve and enhance desirable neighborhood characteristics and modify citywide regulations to allow opportunities for reestablishing sense of place. The planning department is initiating a process to look at our development related codes and our subdivision regulations again to try to make sure that the type of quality development that people would like to build based on new technology and new standards is something that's easy for them to do. So over the next several years, we'll be working on a code update and we will keep you all posted about the progress on that. 
So in, in a nutshell, the planning department promotes neighborhood revitalization through many different initiatives. We talked about the comprehensive plan, our area plans, strong neighborhoods initiative, plus the planning department receives federal funds to help with different programs for low to moderate income areas to do disaster recovery. We have a commercial district revitalization program, many other types of assistance that we can provide to individuals to keep their homes in good shape and repair. So the city's comprehensive plan, we're making strides towards implementing things that are recommended through creating diverse, stable, and mixed income communities. We do this through our development review and making recommendations to council on rezoning proposals every other week. And we also have established a priority to focus on revitalizing and strengthening existing neighborhoods. And our Strong Neighborhoods Initiative is, is an example of how we're really trying to focus in on a uh, comprehensive approach to neighborhood revitalization. And again, uh, through our codes and ordinances, we're able to preserve existing neighborhoods and help promote high quality development of our new neighborhoods. So I wanted to report to you some of the progress we've made towards neighborhood revitalization over the past year. Our down payment assistance program has been able to assist 37 families in buying new homes, and that's to effect of about $500,000. And we're able to leverage about $3.5 million in private mortgages and contributions towards that. 500,000. The home program is another uh, community development program that builds new homes through our partner agencies. We've built two CHODO and home funded projects with a total sales value of $250,000. We're focusing in our strong neighborhoods initiative areas and in the 29th and class and corridor and 14 other homes are underway through this partner. We also provide assistance to single family homes to help strengthen and improve our existing neighborhoods. We do this by providing funding for some housing rehab uh, programs. This last year we've done 78 housing rehabs, investing $2.6 million in existing neighborhoods and adding safety improvements in the form of nine storm shelters and safe rooms for some of those homes. Also our emergency home repair program is able to provide assistance to those who really need immediate repairs to homes. Approximately 80 homes have been repaired this year, and we've invested about $581,000 towards that. And again, you're familiar with our Strong Neighborhoods Initiative, but we do have some new uh, neighborhoods that we are starting to work with. I wanted to report on those. And we have many tools to assist in these areas with our neighborhood revitalization strategies. We receive about $1.5 million a year in our HUD, CDBG, and home funds that we allocate to these neighborhoods. So you can see this is a long list of tools that we use to help strengthen our neighborhoods that we're working with. And accomplishments in the past five years, you can see that our numbers keep growing. In the numbers of new homes that are being built or rehabbed in these neighborhoods, we're able to put physical improvements in neighborhoods, sidewalks, street trees, public art, removing hazardous trees, and also helping with um, after school programs through STEAM. It, the chart on the right is really what I want to point your attention to in that, in that four year period between 2013 and 2017, we were able to leverage twice the non-city dollars to our city dollar. And you've seen these graphs reporting on the first five years in the original three neighborhoods we were working in. What I really want to point out to you is that this is showing average home sales prices. So as we go into neighborhoods who have vacant and abandoned buildings or vacant lots and we're putting infill housing, we see these housing prices steadily increasing in each of these neighborhoods. And at the same time, we're seeing our crime rates decrease in our neighborhoods. The dotted line shows the citywide average and you can see that some of our neighborhoods had higher than um, average crime, but in those neighborhoods, we're happy to say that the overall crime rate has been steadily de decreasing. And as far as our new Strong Neighborhoods Initiative areas, our two Strong Neighborhoods areas are going to be graduating from assistance in June. That would be the Class in Ten Pen and the Class in North Highland Parked Neighborhoods. And we're able to go through a very uh, full process of determining neighborhoods we could add on um, to our program to maintain three neighborhoods that we're working in. And we selected two new neighborhoods that are within our neighborhood revitalization strategy area. They qualified based on household income and affordability and owner-occupied residences. And then we applied additional criteria to, you can go ahead and advance one more slide, to make sure that they were the best fit for our resources and our program. So extensive analysis was done to 
be able to identify areas that were eligible, and then we went through a process to select those. And council did confirm those um, a couple of months ago. And our new neighborhoods that we will be uh, working in are Capitol View and Capitol Hill. You can see here on this map. And we will continue to work in the Culbertson's East Highland neighborhood. Um, and I just wanted to say that we are committed to doing neighborhood revitalization and continuing to work with all of our partners, our city departments, um, some of our partners like the Alliance and Okura and Neighborhood Alliance. Um, this is the heart of what they do, and we're committed to uh, helping you see those positive results in your measures for strong neighborhoods. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And Bob Tiener. Good morning. I'm going to wrap up the presentation here. I'll do a, just briefly talk about development services in each of the divisions and how they interact with customers. Um, primarily, we have subdivision zoning, development center, which does the building permits, uh, code enforcement that you're aware of, and animal welfare. This first slide, I want to talk a little bit about my subdivision and zoning uh, staff. As you're, as you're aware, they're really responsible for interpreting the subdivision ordinance and the subdivision regulations and meet with developers. Uh, they also are the primary staff for the subdivision board of adjustment, and they prepare the memos that you see each Tuesday. But one thing that, that we don't talk a lot about is they, it's, they're an important piece of, of developing ordinances. This picture uh, represents the home share Airbnb ordinance that's working its way through the process. Uh, they work with legal and with planning. And uh, so a lot of the ordinances that we look at, we try to make sure that they're reasonable for our citizens. And uh, as you'll learn when this gets to council, right now it's at Planning Commission, so anticipate probably June. Uh, there's some strong opinions on this home share Airbnb, but it's, it's important to neighborhoods. Uh, the development center you're aware of, they issue building permits. Um, they do inspections. You know, right now, if you need a residential permit, in most cases, you can get that in one day. Uh, if you have a commercial permit, it takes 10 to 15 days to get your first review. If you need an inspection, you can do that, and you can, most of the time, you'll get that in one day. So we're, we're, they're really efficient at that. But one thing I want to point out here is each May, they have a, a national building safety month. And this division will go to Lowe's. They partner with Lowe's, and they'll set up a booth, and they'll talk to people that come in. You know, the Lowe's is a home improvement store where people think that they can do their hot water tank and, and those things. And our staff's there just to try to give them, uh, make sure that they understand that some things need permits, some things need inspections. And really, this is a piece of public safety. You heard from police and fire, but, you know, getting things built to code and getting proper inspections is another part of public safety. And this year they did the home and garden show, which is another situation where people come in and look for home improvement things. And we, we were there to you know, hand out flyers, answer questions. It was just another way to reach out to the neighborhoods. You know, you want, we want our neighborhoods to be safe. Um, now I want to talk about animal welfare, uh, our community programs. Uh, currently we do uh, a free spade and neuter program for citizens. You know, as we all know, pets are a large part of neighborhoods now. You just can't get away from that. We did over 4,000 free spade and neuters for citizens of Oklahoma City. If you need a spade and neuter, you live in Oklahoma City, just give us a call and we can, we can arrange that. Uh, they do a lot of uh, outreach. You know, it's really, it's really important for uh, new pet owners to understand how important it is to take care of your pet and control your pet, you know. Uh, I want to bring up the, unfortunately, last year we had a situation with loose dogs. A, a lady lost her life. And we, uh, working with legal and Councilman Stonecipher and McAtee, uh, we developed a menacing dog ordinance, which basically gives our field officers other tools to try to get out in front of you know, try to stop those kind of situations. If we know about loose dogs, you know, maybe we can, we can head it off. And another important piece of that, uh, when, you, when the council approved that ordinance, it allowed us to, to require chipping of every animal. So now we'll have, if an animal comes back to us, we'll have that information at the shelter and we'll know if there's a pattern developing. 
So that's, that's one of the things that's really helped us. Uh, I think we did over, we've done over 7,000 chipping since that ordinance was adopted. I think it was in August of last year. So uh, our adoption events, uh, we, we have a mobile adoption uh, unit that we can take anywhere in the city. And uh, it really helps us get out to, you know, like I think we had one event at, uh, event at a McDonald's. You know, it gives us some flexibility on where we can go. Uh, we had a couple of events where we actually cleared the shelter of all our adoptable animals. So those are the kind of things that, uh, and the next slide here in a minute, I'll show you what, what those things have done for us. We have a very active volunteer program. We do an OKC kids program. You know, the shelter, uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't do their work without volunteers. And so, you know, anybody that wants to volunteer, they're, they're more than welcome because we can find something for them to do. So this next slide, uh, this is probably my favorite slide. Uh, this is our live release rate. As you can see in, in uh, 2017, we were under 30% of the number of animals that left the shelter live. And this year we're projecting to hit our goal of 75%. So, I mean, that's to me is one of the biggest accomplishments that, that you can have. The staff there, the, current superintendent they've all worked really hard to reach you know reach this goal um, um, i think that's my favorite slide too i came on the council in 2008 so from 35 to 75 percent well i mean we've got there so with great. the with the support of council and the manager's office giving us you know the the opportunities to do do some things and uh, we also uh, just this year we've changed our our strategic business plan to go to 80% as our goal by 2021. So we've got some things that we're going to try and, uh, you know, hopefully we can continue to improve on that number. I want to talk a little bit about code enforcement. Uh, you know, they're active. Uh, they attend neighborhood associations. They try to educate neighborhoods of what violate, what, what are violations and what aren't violations. You know, we, uh, Talk to them about, you know, if you've got complaints, how to turn them in, how to how we'll react to them, what the processes are. Um, one of the things that we do, Councilman McAtee, this has been several years ago, but we started a neighborhood association sign association sign program, where our staff actually signs volunteers, uh, trains volunteers from neighborhoods to pick up signs, those trash signs that we see all over. It's really helped us in the enforcement of that and. Uh, Right now, we have 18 neighborhoods that are involved in that. And I want to talk just briefly about yard parking. Uh, we we have a proactive program on yard parking. Uh, just go next slide. There's just some examples. Uh, the slide I really want you to see is this last one. Go um, one more. There we go. Um, the annual custom customer city uh, customer survey. Uh, this has been our top uh, customer satisfaction is our enforcement of yard parking. It's at 49 percent. It's been going up for the last three years. I mean, yard parking is one of the indicators when a neighborhood may be in some distress, and uh, you know, enforcing this ordinance gives us an opportunity to help those neighborhoods. The next slide is uh, the abandoned building program. You do that every Tuesday. I think you added 11 to the list just today. Uh, so since we started the program in, uh, I think it was February of 2015, we've, we've had 1,000 uh, properties declared, and since then we've had 53% removed. Um, you, you may not remember, but when, when this, the state law was changed, they gave us the authority to uh, charge for police and fire calls and try to re recapture the cost of those calls. So when a property's moved off the abandoned building list, that means they've paid those costs. And that's, you know, that's something we haven't ever had the ability to do in the past. So our current number, that's probably going to be like 485 after today's meeting. But. And then this last slide, this is, uh, this is our one slide that's uh, an indicator of thriving neighborhoods. And what we try to, what we strive to do is, when we have a violation, we work with neighbors to try to get them to comply. And uh, if we can get them to comply, that saves us from having to write citations and going through that process. 
Uh, our, our number's up 14% over the last, last year, over 72% of people. You know, and when someone in a neighborhood has a problem and they, they're willing to do the work to get their property in compliance, you know, that just helps strengthen that neighborhood. And with that, I'll answer any questions. I, I have a question. I just, I mean, we talked earlier about code enforcement and, and responding to complaints. How, and, and we also talked about that um, just selective enforcement. And I understand that, that we have constraints in terms of, of the number of code enforcement officers, but how do we, how do we reconcile that with the, with the 14th Amendment, which applies specifically to state and local governments, that, that guarantees the right of every citizen equal protection under the laws, that, you, that every citizen has the same rights as any other citizen and has a right to the same due process and same protections and application of the law to any citizen. It, that's the 14th Amendment, which is specific for state and local governments. How do we reconcile only enforcing the law if there's a complaint from a citizen and allowing violations of ordinances to persist if there's not a complaint with that portion of the 14th Amendment? Yeah, that's a question probably for Kenny Jordan to answer. But I, I think we did try to touch on that earlier a little bit this morning. You know, there, there's a lot of things like speeding tickets. We don't go and, and, and enforce every speeding zone that's out there. And so we are uniform on how, and, and we have rationale for how we enforce our ordinances. But I really think that Kenny Jordan probably needs to give you more specific uh, response to that. I think he does too. I mean, I, I think that it's, oh, speak of the devil. I was going to take the fifth. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was, I was trying not to come back in, but since I'm here, the, we can write a, a, an opinion on that if you want. There's, I, there there are cases that uphold enforcement of ordinances by complaint basis, so. I'd love to see that. So you can write, you can write an just, opinion just a bit, yeah. as to how that complies with the 14th Amendment and its Equal Protection Clause. Right. Okay. Thank you. Because otherwise you'd have to repeal, like, 75% of the city code because, yeah, it, it's always been done that way. Always been done complaint basis. Complaint based. basis. Okay. Right. And then, but what happens then when you learn about the existence of something else and it's, it's still just complaint based? Some, I, that, I know what their practice is. When you, uh, discover a violation when you're enforcing another violation. So, so Spencer's, for example, we've talked about that. That's 876 feet from the neighborhood. So now, so now you know that. So that's a violation of the ordinance. So would you now, with, would you vote, would you, would you issue a citation to Spencer's who's selling the same goods as Adam and Eve now that you know that? Well, the inspector will have to go out and inspect, not, not just inspect the store, but also measure the distance. Okay, well, you can do that on Google Maps. It's 876 feet. Well, the inspector has to be able to testify to that in court, so the inspector has to measure okay. it himself. So the so, question is, would you do that? You, you only do that if somebody complains? Well, I mean, if, if I'm aware of a violation, then I, I feel like it's my responsibility to to look into it, to investigate it, or have the inspector investigate it. So, okay. uh, but we'll get with the municipal counselor's office and decide how best to do that. Okay, uh, thank you. Citizens to be heard, Michael. Yeah. Okay. Michael, you'll have three minutes and we'll need your name and address for the record. Let me get about 10 minutes. Mayor, I need that now. Sorry, Michael. Just I hope on it. Michael Washington, 2900 Northeast 18th Street. First of all, let me say I've enjoyed the proceedings today. I mean, real illustriously. But I want to talk about a situation with our teachers. I'm very, very frustrated and it's a frightening reality that come April 2nd, all our teachers may go on strike, and they're going to have to be replaced with replacements. And that's not a good idea, especially for a lot of these young children who need to be in these schools. 
Now, I want to let you all know the joking part has now ceased from me. You know, you have a situation here where these young kids are going into these schools and trying to learn to get an education so they can become mayors or business owners or what have you. But when you have a legislator, again, refusing to give the monies out to the necessary school districts to prepare for the education of our children, I think that's very frightening. And in reality, what you're going to do is increase, you know, homelessness, joblessness, incarceration, so forth and so on. Now, I don't have enough time to get all of this, so I'm going to have to basically cut that off now. But I do want to say something else, again, regarding my northeast side of Oklahoma City. Now, I'm going to take a step with Brother Brent. I call him Brother Brent now. He don't like that, but I call him that anyway. We're going to talk about, you know, him giving me some of that tax income and finance money for the Ward 7 over there, District 9, because we need some of that money as well, man. I mean, you know, I have a freedom center, okay? Matter of fact, I've got that issue straightened out. I run that now. Anthony Douglas, NAACP, and all the people, zip, get out of here. Okay, so now we know you can talk to me on any kind of question about a dilapidation. Yes, yeah, dilapidated. Now, I'd like some order somebody to tell me to straighten it out because that will help me get some money. Okay, I want you to let you know that. But now, anyhow, I need some of that tax income and finance, $60 million supposed to be an earmark for the northeast side that I only see outside businesses coming in and getting. I haven't seen one black person that's from the northeast side receive any kind of money of this tax increment dollars. Now, where, I mean, how is that? Again, this man just mentioned it quite uh, eloquently, a violation of the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, equal protection. No state or citizen's government should discriminate against its citizens, just like you cannot establish a, a government respective religion. Well, you shouldn't be able to also discriminate against people in their environments by saying, you ready for this? It's all part of a gentrification process. That's why all these other outside agencies are coming into the northeast side now, basically buying up with through urban renewal, buying up all these properties that we just saw, 152 of them dilapidated buildings where the gentleman just showed on the graphic. Okay, these are the things right now that we need to start addressing. I don't want these people coming in here, and I'm not going to accept it, coming in here, moving people out, buying properties up for little or nothing then reestablishing those same properties and putting their businesses over here to move their families in by moving African Americans out. Now, if you look at it at the same time, the Urban Renewal thought had more than 700 properties now. All of a sudden, they just acquired. I wonder how that happened. You do that by, you know, depreciating the value of a community on the northeast side. By depreciating that value, then you say, okay, well, now everybody's moving out. Threats that the kids have to be busted, what have you. So yeah. now you take them out and you say, okay, now let's move these people out. Let's do it in a clandestine way without letting them know what the real process is. Mike, I need, I need you to wrap it up. Okay, I'm getting ready to wrap it up. But let me say this here in closing. We need to address an issue. I need some of that money. I need y'all to help me get it because y'all can do that. Everything comes to you. You stop the buck right here. Just like when they come and ask y'all for money, hey, I need on 88th Street. Council has approved. I, I need y'all to approve me to have at least $50,000 to fix my or house up. Freedom Center. Thank you very much. All right. Have Thanks, a good day. Michael. I've got to run. You want to come over? We'll need your name and address for the record. Thank you, Your Honor. Andrew Ryerson Gonzalez, 2905 Northwest 70th Street. And um, in regards to the possible rem remedies that we heard earlier, um, Councillor Jordan was asked uh, if we were just selling lingerie, would that be acceptable? And, and I believe your answer was you thought that that would probably be okay if it was just a lingerie store. So I'd like to speak for just a second to that, to that matter. When we were first issued that notice of code violation, we did uh, request to meet with the code enforcement officials, and um, we did that. And there was um, uh, one of the city councilors present. It was a room filled with lots of people. And we wanted to definitely meet the city halfway. So I specifically asked that question uh, because the vast majority of the goods in our store are lingerie and soft goods, not adult novelty products as one might suspect without having walked into our establishment. So the answer that we got was, uh, well, if lingerie could stimulate the human genitals, then you would be in violation. I said, okay, well, what about um, condoms? We sell condoms, and, and everybody sells condoms. I mean, every uh, gas station, Walmart, CV, every, uh, well, they go on a penis. I said, but if they're a medical device, how is, how is that not acceptable for us 
to be selling. So in regards to the remedy that we um, back off on the novelty products and just sell lingerie and soft goods, the problem that we face is that we've already come to the city with our hat in our hand and said, how do we be good neighbors? How do we be in compliance then, since we choose to be in compliance, when the language of this statute, this ordinance, is so arbitrary and vague? As uh, Vice Mayor uh, Shadid had, had pointed out in, in earlier converse, conversations. So we can't get solid guidance from the city when we are trying our darndest to be that good neighbor. Because if we have one counselor saying, no, that violates, we have another one saying, well, I think a laundry store would be fine, then, then we have a, a problem here with that. Um, and then in regards to uh, Councilwoman Sawyer saying that, you know, we made a mistake, I, I, would, I would submit that um, and we did purchase the property. When we did our due diligence, and our broker did the due diligence, since we are a general retail establishment that majoritively sells soft products, uh, we looked to see if that was zoned for retail, and it, and it was. And there's nothing in the zoning code that spoke to uh, adult novelties or these circles of exclusion. In fact, this is what we asked for you to consider repealing today is in Chapter 30, which is miscellaneous criminal ordinances. So in our due diligence process, we, we never saw this. And uh, just as the Vice Mayor had pointed out, uh, it, it, again, in earlier conversations, um, in his ward and in everyone's ward that's in here, going and looking at other established, decades established businesses that are in these proximities, we don't see how we are different, except in that perhaps we tend to exclude children. So when uh, Councilor Stonecipher, you know, had mentioned that, well, we could just move our business, I, I believe that was you, sir. Um, yeah, that's a possibility. So. Just for a second, if we want to look at the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law, if we put a different business in, in that property that we have on Northwest 70th Street, and then I went to Penn Square Mall, and I decided to lease space, and I wouldn't do it right next to Spencer's because, um, as I pointed out in the last hearing, they're in violation. But let's just say that I go far enough into the mall that I'm just over that thousand foot circle from residences. So I would be in letter compliance with that ordinance. But then I said, well, you know, I do want to compete with Spencer's. I don't have um, as strong a morals as I used to, so I'm going to not prohibit children from coming into the store. How would that serve the public? How would that be family friendly to Oklahoma? How would that be in anyone's best interest? It's not. So let's, it's we've, not. we've gone past the three minutes, but let me, so Kenny, in terms of applying for a uh, variance, so they hire a lawyer, they pay a fee, which is what, a couple thousand dollars to apply for a variance? Bob has left. He could tell you. I'm not sure exactly what it is. And then how, wh how do they decide, or Mark, you can, how, do, what do they, what kind of, how do they decide if you get to go in, continue or you're not, or go around the ordinance or not? Get a variance. They should hire legal counsel for that. I mean, Someone just, that knows about variances to present their case to the Board of Adjustment. Right. Okay. You can get the materials on the Board of Adjustments. It lists the four factors that have to be met to, to get the variance, and the city offers that for free. Okay. Right. And then... Whatever the Board of Adjustment does, if the board turns them down, they can go to district court on that. And so okay. it's a statutory process. It's in Title 11, Article 44. Okay. There's criteria by the Board of Adjustment on what 
criteria by the Board of Adjustment and what, what they look at, specific criteria is spelled out in the ordinances, correct? It's in, in the statute, state, state statute, statute, and there are a lot of cases on that. Okay. And, and, and could I possibly ask the council to consider reviewing the language in this ordinance, to, to study it for a period of time, to have a moratorium, uh, even, even Councilman Greiner had um, agreed with some of the merits of the argument at the last public hearing, where I did bring up the subject of age well, limit, I think, which is important. So I, I think that I have learned that if now if, you, if they apply for a variance, then there's a moratorium on there's for, a, on our end for there's an automatic statutory stay on any further actions in uh, in furtherance of enforcing the ordinance while the variance is pending, and that could be the board of adjustment or district of court or. As long as that's still in dispute, then the city of Oklahoma City won't it's both, have a moratorium. It's both the board of it's well, it's in the statute. It's a statutory stay. It's in the board of adjustment and in district court. Okay. After the district court ruling, though, there's no stay. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Executive.